Welcome back, friends. It's time once again for us to venture down a complete iceberg. Internet creepypastas have some of the most unique concepts and uses of their media. From stories about dark web murderers to a haunted website that can predict how you'll die, internet creepypastas are just the beginning of the creepypasta rabbit hole. So join me, friends, as we take another dive. This is the complete internet creepypasta iceberg explained. Let's begin our descent. The first internet creepypasta that we'll be looking at is one that most of you already know. Not for the infamy or virality, but more so for how prevalent it's been within the community. Annie96's typing is a true classic in the world of creepypastas. It's one of the first stories you're likely to hear if you're just getting started with internet horror. In fact, it might even be the story you'd run into even if you were just browsing the internet. It's a story that is easy to spread and one that many have. The story is credited to Pascal Chatterjee on the Creepypasta Wiki. Annie96 appears on screen and sends a message to her friend McDavy. She asks if he's asleep. No, guess you're not either, he responds. They start talking about pretty mundane stuff. A few jokes here and there, your standard late night conversation. Annie says that the wind is really loud for some reason. David says that he can't hear any wind, just the rain. The conversation shifts as Annie says she hears footsteps on the gravel outside her window. David tells her to have her crazy dad go check it out. Annie reminds him that her parents went on holiday together and she's all alone. She continues by saying that the footsteps seem odd somehow and asks if she should look out the window. David tells her that it's probably nothing and if she's home alone, she probably shouldn't look. A moment later, she says that she sees someone in her garden, a man and he's on his hands and knees looking for something in her bushes. It actually appears that he might be digging. David jokes that he might be high and she just needs to move away from the window. Annie tells David to stop messing with her, saying that the man in the garden looks just like him. He has the same football jacket and everything. She says that she was banging on the window to get his attention, but thinks that it's odd that he's still sending her messages without his phone in his hand. David says that there's no way that's him and that she's starting to scare him. He says he would never do anything so mean. She starts to believe that it's not him until she sees his name on the back of the jacket. The other David has seen her, smiles, and makes his way towards the house. David tells her to call the police, but she doesn't respond. He calls for her, but they won't arrive for 30 minutes at the earliest. She finally does respond and says that she's hiding in her closet with a knife as she heard it break in. It then starts to call out to her. It doesn't sound like David at all. The voice is deep, echoey and wrong. It keeps saying, come out Annie, I just want to look at you. It keeps repeating this phrase over and over again. Finally, Annie tells David to stop thinking about her. That this creature seems to be connected to him, so maybe it would go away if he did that. It didn't make sense to him, but he tried anyway. Her responses started coming in, and it seemed to have worked. The thing had just left, like it had never been there in the first place. Annie asks David what she should tell the cops when they arrive. He said to tell them everything, and that he's glad she's safe. Annie says that she didn't know that's how he felt about her, and wanted to see him tomorrow. David says he'll come by right away. Annie replies with a smiley face and says, Great, can't wait. David types one last thing. Annie? Annie, how do I know this is you? This is followed by the message, Annie96 is offline. Username 666 is an infamous creepypasta that appears in video form on YouTube. 
The original video was posted in 2008 on a channel named Nana825763. This was one of the earliest examples of someone using YouTube as a medium for horror content. The video appears to show what happens when a person searches for a channel named 666 on YouTube. All they see is that the account has been suspended. The user in the video then starts to refresh the page. With each refresh of the page, nothing appears to happen. After a while, the recommended videos lose their thumbnails and only have 666 written in them. The refreshing continues until everything starts to deteriorate. Red covers the screen in a macabre vision of hell. All the videos on the site are grotesque and tinged in the same color. Flesh and blob-like masses cover the backgrounds of the site. The user clicks on the videos and is met with pulsating bloody beings with inhuman movements. The visuals are garish, but so is the audio. Gurgles, chewing, the sound of things touching a wet surface. Every number on the site has 666 in it, including the view count. The mouse begins to frantically float about the screen, trying to backspace and close out. The sound of rejection from their PC rings out with each attempt. Even the background on their PC appears changed, now showing black tendrils behind the open window. All attempts to close out of the tab are fruitless. Even trying to shut off the computer doesn't work. The video continues with a thumping sound being heard over the gurgling and strained whispers. Until finally, a hand reaches out and the video cuts away. This is username 666 and is one of the earliest forms of video creepypasta on the internet. It was very popular and even today is considered a great piece of the dark side of YouTube. It has amassed an astounding 17 million views since its debut. The video would be followed up by a video titled Another YouTube. This video was released in 2010 and has a similar vibe to the original. It starts with the user going to YouTube on his PC and clicking through settings until they see a tab titled Another YouTube with a try button underneath. He clicks it and sees a different version of YouTube for a split second. The icons go to the same fleshy look as the prior video before flashing back to normal with another click. He decides to click it again and search the site. Everything has a disgusting quality. Red tinges everything again. This time he clicks on the videos and sees distorted messes of red, blue, and green. There appear to be eyes and mouths tinged in red across the screen. Eyes seem to be watching from every corner of the site. His webcam comes on and shows his hand on the mouse. He closes it multiple times, but it keeps coming up. More notices appropriate the screen, leaving him with no idea how to close everything. It gets more and more intense until we see him finally pull the plug on his PC. Generation Loss is a story uploaded to the Creepypasta wiki in 2011 by user Panko Bell. The story is pretty short, so we'll be reading it in full. In 2007, a British audio programmer and electronic musician attempted to make a video documenting Generation Loss, which is when one tape is copied from another, but each incarnation wears the quality down by a certain amount. He used a spare tape recorded by a friend in the early 90s, featuring footage of a nearby intersection edited his own music into the clip, and then copied it back and forth until the footage had deteriorated enough. However, this clip circulated on 4chan Sector B in mid-2008, with first-hand reports claiming that watching this entire video in one sitting caused a sharp, burning sensation in the back of the skull. Common side effects included hearing screams deep in the tape's grinding music, seeing human shapes in the static, and seeing a disturbingly thin young boy in the window to the immediate left of the yellow traffic light who is staring directly at the viewer. While the effects can be avoided by pausing the video and watching or reading anything else for any amount of time, it is unknown what will happen to an individual if the entire video is consumed without stopping, as these effects vary from person to person. Some users have reported long-term effects of seeing the skeletal boy around them in public, or hearing vague whispers and clicking. One user reportedly took his own life out of desperation, he did this by throwing himself out of his apartment window. His body discovered to have severe bruising on the back of his skull. At this time, I'm unsure if this story was actually circulated around 4chan or not. As far as I can tell, it hasn't. That doesn't mean that it didn't in the past, though, as that's just how this site works. 
It feels like a story that would circulate the X boards, though. There is footage that coincides with this particular story, which you are watching now. The idea of seeing something in the corrupted footage is a cool and disturbing idea. Imagine watching an old degraded film and every time the corruption shows up on screen, you see something getting closer. The Blind Maiden website is a creepypasta uploaded in 2014 and written by Space Maniac 888 The story is about a supposed website that will give you the greatest fright of your life. It was quite popular in the online sphere back when it was uploaded. The website is called blackmaiden.com and it offers those brave enough to search it out the choice to experience the ultimate horror. The site supposedly houses a doomed spirit you can enter your home if you choose to access the website. There are some stipulations for accessing it though. It needs to be midnight where you live when you try to go on the URL. It also needs to be the night of a new moon. You must be alone and turn off all lights so that none but your computer screen are visible. Accessing the site will flood your screen with images. Kids with no eyes will face you directly. This is followed by text that reads, this website will take you to a whole new level of horror. A horror that will use all five of your senses. You must be very careful not to click on anything by accident. You will be faced with a real experience of absolute horror. Click the accept button to engage actively in the experience. You are then presented with two options. Accept to continue to the website or decline. Clicking decline will show you gruesome images. Gore will fill your screen enough to make any person sick. If you click accept on the other hand, a sinister silhouette will start walking towards you on your monitor. The screen will shift until the figure seems to enter a room. Then you'll notice that you can see your back on the monitor. A tap on your shoulder can be felt before being swung around to meet face to face with the blind maiden. She then proceeds to pluck your eyes and take a photo of your face. You have just joined the website's homepage. This is your reward for going to the website and completing its ritual. This story is more of a warning not to go looking for the site, but that probably won't stop you now, will it? Barbie.avi is a classic in the world of creepypastas. It's one that's been told many times in many different formats. This story was uploaded in 2009 and was received very well, quickly becoming a popular story in the community. It also had videos attached that were supposed to be what we were seeing in the story, but I'll get to that later. The story begins with an unnamed narrator talking about a party he was attending at a friend's loft. He rented a loft in the industrial side of town which meant it was surrounded by mostly abandoned factories and buildings. The narrator decides to crash on his friend's couch since he'd been drinking too much that night. He wakes up at 4 a.m. to use the bathroom and notices the sun isn't up yet, but he can vaguely see the urban decay by a soft blue light from the window. He says that he actually likes places like these, that he was comforted by them somehow. Laying back down, he tries to fall back asleep. 45 minutes go by and he decides to give up and call his girlfriend to ask for a ride. She says she'll be there in about 30 minutes, so he decides to wait by the window since his phone is dying. Staring out the window, he starts to doze off. He's nearly asleep when he hears a loud crashing sound from outside the window. At first, he didn't see anything, until he notices a computer and monitor lying on the ground near a trash pile across the street. His girlfriend arrives and as the pair are leaving, he decides to check out the computer as he remembers his friend needs spare parts. Luckily for him, the tower seemed in perfect shape, while the monitor had seen better days. He grabs the tower, loads it into the car, and heads home. A week later, he was grabbing the tower from his girlfriend's trunk. He'd actually forgotten about it until then. He brought it home and was skeptical about whether it would work or not. To his surprise, it started up with Windows XP. The first thing that he did was try to see if any files were left over on the computer. There wasn't much to be found as it appeared to have been wiped clean. Further searching brought him to what he'd been hoping to find, 
a single folder titled Barbie, with an AVI file of the same name inside. This is an excerpt from the story. The movie was about an hour long and was made up of what seemed like raw exported footage. The footage was of this woman sitting on a chair and talking against a white backdrop. I skipped through most of the movie and it was all the same continuous shot. Then I decided to sit through the footage to find out what she was talking about. 15 seconds into the footage, the audio goes completely bad and her voice is drowned in harsh static background noise. I couldn't make out a thing. So I imported the footage into the final cut and tried to mess with the levels to isolate her voice. It helped a little, but I still couldn't hear what she was saying. I was intrigued now, and I began to really pay attention to her face and body language. It seemed that she's being asked some kind of questions, because she stops at times to listen and then continues talking. About 15 minutes into the footage, her face begins to redden and contort as if the questions are starting to bother her. But she continues to answer them anyway. Shortly after, she begins to cry. She sobs hysterically for the duration of the film. One of the few words I could lip read was skin. She repeats this word many times throughout the footage, and at one point she even pulls the skin from her arm and mouths the word. She seems to be unhappy with her skin. There's much more I have to get off my chest, but it is getting late and I can't go on. I will share the rest tomorrow. God save my soul. I kept on building and building, and about 40 minutes in, she's crying so hard she can barely look at the camera. She stops talking at this point, and the rest of the footage is just her crying with her head down. Oddly enough, she doesn't get up or move, the screen just fades to black. I was dumbfounded. The narrator rewatched the video multiple times that night. He wanted to see what other secrets this video was holding. As he mulled over the footage for a fifth time, he saw that there was actually more footage in the timeline. It cuts to black for about two minutes of that, then the screen comes back. There appeared to be an accidental recording of someone walking on a train track. A pair of legs were seen walking along the tracks, but the footage was extremely shaky. This lasted for about six minutes before the legs were seen heading over a makeshift bridge made of plywood and going into the woods. This excited the narrator because he knew that there were train tracks near where he was. They even looked similar to the ones he'd seen in the video. This could turn into a little adventure with maybe some answers to his questions ready for him to find. Excitedly, he told his friend Ezra to go with him. When he had arrived, though, Ezra was still sleeping and declined to go. That didn't stop the narrator from grabbing his flashlight, pocket knife, and camera and going it alone. He parked at the train station and started following the tracks. Two hours passed before he saw something that looked promising. A makeshift bridge of plywood that turned into a full plywood path lay ahead of him. It was just like in the video. He walked slowly down the trail, listening for anyone or anything that might be nearby. It was quiet, more than he'd expected. The quiet was more nerve-wracking than comforting, though. Nearing the edge of the trail, the tree line opened up to an old house. It looked to have been abandoned for decades at least. Maybe two or three max. He crouched at the tree line for a while just examining the house, and took a few photos. After a long while, he mustered up the courage to approach the house. At first glance, it looked like a normal abandoned home. The windows were all broken, the siding was peeling, and the doors looked older than time itself. But as he entered the home, he noticed some odd things. On first inspection, these things didn't really stick out to him. It was only retrospectively that he took note. All the doors were old and open except for a door that presumably led to the basement, which was new and locked. There was also the bathroom. The mirror for some reason was clean, when everything else was covered in a thick layer of dust. There was also a clear tarp that lay in the bathtub, with some water droplets still on it. That's when a clear and loud moan could be heard from somewhere in the building, and he jumped out one of the windows. He ran from the property and didn't stop until reaching his car. That was the last time he'd been to that building. Even though in retrospect, the moan was likely from an old pipe in the building or something. He wondered why the water was still on, though, at an old abandoned building in the middle of nowhere. The first thing I want to note about this story is that there are videos attached to it. These are the videos that we saw in Barbie.avi. They show a woman who appears to be giving an interview. These videos are creepy because of the editing and the story attached. The audio is garbled, and you can't really tell what she's saying. The woman is missing an arm, and this seems to hint at the story of the house a bit. 
The missing arm could be related to what is happening in the basement of the house. Like they are removing body parts, either willingly or not. The tarp is also a big hint at this, as it could have been used to take the organs. There's a lot of speculation on the story since nothing is outright stated. That's actually one of my favorite parts of the story. I like the unknown, and I feel like it's more fun to speculate in most cases. As far as the video goes, there was a search effort to find the woman in the videos. She was found by all sources I've looked into, but I won't be divulging her name or anything here. Just know that she is okay and her video was just used for the story. There's even her full interview on Archive of Our Own if you want to watch it yourself. The story likely originated from 4chan, like many other early creepypastas. It spread from there to the rest of the internet. This story might not be the scariest, but the video and the timing of its release make it a classic in the community. Enora Petrova is a creepypasta written by One Page Wonder. The story was uploaded to the Creepypasta Wiki in 2014. The story is told through an email between Enora and a friend named Bree. This creepypasta was one of the more popular internet-based stories since it used Wikipedia as a plot element. The story starts with a plea from Enora. She is begging Bree not to delete this email. In it, she is going to explain what has happened since the last time they spoke. They hadn't spoken in quite some time, and this is really just a last chance for her to reach out to her friend. Enora was a figure skater, and she wasn't half bad. In 8th grade, she was nervous about a crystal classic competition she was competing in the next day. She wasn't able to sleep that night and did something that most people do. She googled herself. The usual stuff popped up. There are people with her name living different lives and the like. As she was scrolling down the Google search, she saw a Wikipedia article with her name on it. Curiously, she opened the article. At first, it was mostly skating facts, where she lived, and other general information, which would be creepy enough on its own, but the page continued. She saw a part that said she won the Crystal Classic competition. This surprised her, but also gave her confidence. Maybe her club or her dad had made the page, someone that was trying to give her hope and the confidence that she needed to win. The next day, the competition commenced and she actually won, just like the Wikipedia page had said she would. It was exactly right. This led to her getting a coach named Sergey, who saw real potential in her. Honora began checking the page frequently before every competition. Each competition was listed and each time her placements were exactly as they were told on the page. It even said that she would win regionals at 15, which she did. This is when Honora was pulled from school and told that she had a real shot at the Olympics. Sergei and her parents agreed on a training regiment, and she started immediately. Her skating was good, great even, but she wasn't improving at the rate Sergei had said she should. Sectionals was the next day, and she wasn't feeling confident, so she went on her Wikipedia page again. She decided to edit the page, so that she was the winner of the competition, even though her friend Bree was being called out as the favorite. After she tried to save her update, the page instead changed to this message. Honora is selfish and she's going to get what she deserves. This caused her to break down, which led to her looking awful at the competition the next day. As she was sitting in the stands watching Bree skate, she suddenly found herself on the floor with blood coming from her forehead. Bree's blade had come off of her skate and shot up at Honora. Honora was blamed for Bree's skate breaking because she was supposedly the last person around them. She was banned from all further competitions. Sergei called her a disgrace and everyone walked out on her. The Wikipedia page was also getting worse. Every time she would check it, it would say something awful about her. She tried calling Wikipedia and leaving a complaint about the page, but they couldn't find it. There was no page dedicated to her. While home alone, she decided to check her Wikipedia page to see if it had been taken down yet. There was another update that read, Honora Petrova is a pathetic little orphan. She freaked out and tried to call her parents multiple times, but all she got in response was a horrible laugh. After the accident, she was given her parents' phones. There were no records of her calls to them. She couldn't get that laugh out of her head. It was all too much for her, as she was now more alone than she'd ever been before. When Honora turned 18, she took her parents' settlement money and left the country. She moved to Switzerland, where she planned to reinvent herself. 
she was going to skate for the ice circus. Well, audition anyway. Things were starting to look up for her. Of course, she just had to check her Wikipedia page one more time. Old habits die hard. The page only said one thing. Enora Petrova died friendless and alone. That's not the worst part, though. The date of death is the same as the day she's sending this email. She's terrified sitting alone in her hotel room. She doesn't know what to do. She's going to send this email as soon as it's done. She's waiting for midnight. All she can do is keep refreshing her page. She has to know what happens next. That's the story of Enora Petrova, an obsession with finding out what her future might hold leads to her destroying her present. The idea is probably one of my favorites in the world of creepypastas. I love stories that have a website where you can go to find out something that is supposed to happen, like fortune telling online. The story also has a screenshot of her Wikipedia page. The page has her date of birth, May 5th of 1991, and her date of death, October 24th of 2010. This likely means that this story was uploaded sometime in 2010 before being uploaded to the creepypasta wiki. The interesting part to me is that there's actually more story within the screenshot of Nora's Wikipedia page. In the further information section, there's more story. Let me read it to you. You should learn a lesson from Enora. Enora delved too deep and got what she deserved. But enough about that little piggy. Let's talk about you. All alone and reading this drivel. Tell me. What would you like to be when you grow up? Enora had great aspirations, and I believed in her. At least I did for a while. Such a little piggy. But then, you're not like her, are you? No, I see something great in you. Something unrealized. We could go great places together, you and I. Yes, the more I think about it, the more I realize that this isn't just a case of happenstance. Great things can happen when you stumble upon a page like this. Think about it. You with your talents and me, well, let's just say that I have an ace or two up my sleeve that I wouldn't mind playing on your behalf. So tell me. What do you desire most? Oh, you're thinking about it? And the answer is yes. Together we could accomplish great things. I could help you so much. I could take you places that you've never dreamed of. But first, you're going to have to do something for me. This is where the page ends. There's a cryptic figure who seems to control the past of those that come in contact with the Enora page. This is likely who took out her and her family. Now he extends an offer to us, the reader. Do we take it? After what happened to Enora, what's the worst that could happen? The weird part of YouTube is a short story, but also not. It's easier to explain if I just read it in full. Everyone has been to the weird part of YouTube. If you haven't, then I suggest you try to do so. It's a very simple process. In fact, to make it even easier, I will lay it out in step-by-step -step form. Step one, important. You find any video you want, absolutely anything you want. A cat video, a music video, anything. Something from Japan will work best. Step two, click on the strangest related video. The absolute most mind-blowing looking thumbnail or title. Step three, Continue step two until the most liked comment is, I'm in the weird side of YouTube again, or something along those lines. Now, this alone isn't all that scary. It's mostly just funny. You can laugh at failed ads or absurd stuff from different cultures. Sometimes it gets scarier. A dancing girl with no arms or legs, someone with loads of tattoos eating glass, a crazed hillbilly ranting about how the government will kill everyone. It gets stranger though. Dig deep enough and you can find actual death. I don't mean like the news stories on people getting killed. I mean full on amateur snuff films. No after effects or CGI, real people getting killed. You're wondering why YouTube doesn't take them down, aren't you? Well, there are two reasons for this. First, there are days worth of video being uploaded every minute. So much that it just can't be analyzed by the YouTube staff. They take down anything that isn't art, but even that slips through. Second, money. YouTube only pays attention to the stuff that pays, is protected by copyright, or gets large amounts of views in a short amount of time. That last one is the reason for the 301 views phenomenon. Due to these reasons, there are plenty of people who can easily upload almost unnoticed videos. 
Some of them are truly unnoticed with only two or three views. There are a ton of these amateur snuff films that just require a while of searching. Just try for a few hours. Just be warned, you might not hate what you see. You might just want to see more. Or you might just want to try making one of these videos. After all, they have to come from somewhere. This isn't really a creepypasta and more of a reality. There is so much dark, twisted, and grotesque stuff that can be found on YouTube. The depths of the site are basically unlimited. You can find videos about every fetish or fear. Most of the content you will find on the site won't be real though. There are lots of videos of supposed terrible things, but most of those are staged for shock value. Even so, that doesn't discount all the very real stuff hiding within the walls of YouTube, just waiting to be viewed. Another classic era creepypasta is The Woman in the Oven. It was uploaded to creepypasta.com in 2008, but I feel like it was online much before that. The story is one that I remember a friend texting to me in a chain letter that was spreading around my school. The story was short enough that it could be posted anywhere and not lose any of its creep factor. The story probably would have fit better in my lost episode Iceberg, but for some reason it always struck me as an internet based story. Maybe it's because of the way in which I was exposed to the story. The woman in the oven is rather short, so let's read it together. During the summer of 1983, in a quiet town near Minneapolis, Minnesota, the charred body of a woman was found inside the kitchen stove of a small farmhouse. A video camera was also found in the kitchen, standing on a tripod and pointing at the oven. No tape was found inside the camera at the time. Although the scene was originally labeled as a homicide by police, an unmarked VHS tape was later discovered at the bottom of the farm as well, which had apparently dried up earlier that year. Despite its worn condition and the fact that it contained no audio, police were still able to view the contents of the tape. It depicted a woman recording herself in front of a video camera, seemingly using the same camera the police had found in the kitchen. After positioning the camera to include both her and her kitchen stove in the image, the tape then showed her turning on the oven, opening the door, crawling inside, and then closing the door behind her. Eight minutes into the video, the oven can be seen shaking violently, after which point, Thick black smoke can be seen emanating from it. The camera then continued to point at the oven for another 45 minutes until the batteries apparently died. To avoid disturbing the local community, police never released any information about the tape or even the fact that it was found. Police were also not able to determine who put the tape in the well or why the physical stature of the woman on the tape did not in any way resemble the stature of the woman who was found in the oven. Normal Demonetization for Normal People is a popular story that was written by Cosby Daff. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he's created some very popular creepypastas, including NES Godzilla, which I covered on the channel already, and Faith Buddies, which I covered in my lost episode Iceberg. These stories are well written, and this story is no different. The only issue with covering this story is the subject matter can be bad for YouTube, so I apologize for the forced censorship. Normal for Normal People was uploaded to Cosby Daff's DeviantArt page in 2011. The story was spread to the wiki soon after. This led to many different creepypasta narrators picking up the story and spreading it to their audiences on YouTube. An unnamed narrator tells us that the internet has some pretty sick stuff on it if you look hard enough. Just about every piece of grotesque intrigue can be found somewhere online. This brings him to the topic at hand. He'd recently received an email from someone that he doesn't know. It was a chain mail that read, Hi there, found this site is very nice, thought you might like. Normal for normalpeople.com. Pass it on for the good of mankind. This was your standard chain letter, only the links seemed interesting. He was used to getting these kinds of emails, but this one had piqued his interest. Since he was already bored that day, he decides to follow the strange link. A very generic looking site greeted him. In fact, the site barely looked professional. It was clear that from the outset, the site's creator had also had a tenuous grasp of the English language. This could be seen in a very long-winded rant on the site's homepage, which the narrator didn't screenshot or remember what was said. At the bottom of the page was the site's motto, Normal for Normal People. 
a website dedicated to the eradication of abnormal sexuality. Exploring the site further, he realized that there wasn't anything on it. There were no further links, or anything of that sort. As he was about to leave the site, he noticed something odd with the rant section. Each word of the rant appeared to be a hyperlink. Deciding that he was still interested in where this rabbit hole led, he clicked on one of the words and was taken to a new page. He clicked different links for five minutes and kept seeing new pages full of new links. Nothing of substance was found though. Just as he was getting annoyed and ready to check out, the last link he clicked downloaded a video file. It was titled, peanut.avi. Opening the video, he was greeted with a 30 minute video of a woman, man, and a dog in a kitchen. The woman would make a peanut butter sandwich, hand it to the man, who would then feed it to the dog. This lasted the entire 30 minutes. It was in no way connected to the title of the site. How could anyone get turned on by this? Even with all of the out there kinks that people have. The narrator was curious still and ended up finding a dozen videos. This is when he decided to go to his favorite image board and post what he'd found. Only, he found that a thread already existed for the site. He clicked through it and found two dozen other videos that had been found and posted by others. That was enough for him to decide to venture deeper into the site. This is when he started to find the real weird videos. Starting with lickedclean.avi, which was a video of a repairman fixing a washing machine. As soon as he's done, a man enters the shot and begins to lick the washing machine. This lasts for seven minutes. Jimbo.avi is the next video. It shows five minutes of an obese mime doing his act. It was pretty funny overall. The last two minutes of the video cut to the mime sobbing in the corner. Diana.avi is the first video to have anything adult in it. The video appears to be a normal interview with a woman that plays violin. She can be seen holding the violin and talking, but she keeps looking off to the side every few minutes. It was later noticed that you can see a man in a chicken mask, off screen, playing with himself. Jessica.avi is another four minute video. This one has a woman being interviewed outside, but the cameraman keeps zooming in on the street behind the woman. Those that have seen the video have struggled to figure out exactly where this video was shot. To this day, no one has been able to identify the street or why he was so fixated on it. Tongtied.avi has an old woman making out with a mannequin before the video cuts to black. When it comes back, the woman is nowhere to be seen and the mannequins have multiplied. They are surrounding the cameraman and all staring blankly at him. Stumps.avi shows a man with no legs breakdancing on a DDR mat with a radio playing music in the background. The man collapses from exhaustion and asks someone off screen if he can stop. A voice can be heard shouting at him to continue dancing, which he does. He starts to cry as a voice off camera screams. Privacy.avi has a woman on a mattress touching herself. This is all happening while the man from Stumps.avi is walking around on his hands. He appears to be wearing a goblin mask. The door in this interview room is open now, where in every other video it was closed. Something can be seen racing by the door. The final video was titled Useless.avi. This video showed a blonde woman, one that was being interviewed earlier. She was tied to the mattress from before and tape covered her mouth. The door swings open and shows a man in a black suit. He doesn't enter the room and instead brings a chimpanzee into the room. He looks like he's been shaved and painted red. It's clear that they did something to work him up into a frenzy as he looks aggressive. The chimp is let into the room and soon starts to maul the tied down woman. He kills her before starting to eat her. This goes on for four minutes before the video comes to an end. The narrator went back to the thread to discuss his findings, only to find it deleted. The entire thread is gone, and every one that he tries to make gets deleted. The site has also been wiped from the internet, likely due to the authorities finding it. The site had some truly dark secrets. There was so much more that he wished he could find. It was really for the best, though. Who knows how depraved the site could have truly become. I read my sister's Facebook page as a story that was posted to the No Sleep subreddit in 2017. The story was posted by user SleepyHollow101. The story focuses on someone who just lost their sister. There was an accident, and her naturally clumsy sister had fallen down the stairs, something she'd done plenty of times when they were younger, only this time she'd broken her neck during the fall. 
This left the narrator with access to her sister's Facebook page. It wasn't on purpose, though. She just knew her sister's info since she was given it years ago. Part of her healing process was to go through her sister's Facebook page and see the things she liked and interacted with. This led her to looking into her sister's messages. She tried not to, but ultimately would give in when she saw one from Ted. Ted was her sister's husband, the one who had looked ill at the funeral. The message came through as if he were admitting to her sister some final thing. He laments about how angry he was, not just at the situation, but angry in general. The narrator had been at the store to pick up iron pills for her sister as she had anemia, which caused bruising on her arms. That's when she got the call that her sister had an accident. Her whole perception of the situation was starting to shift, though, as she continued reading Ted's messages. He admitted to being angry at the narrator's sister, and that he knew that she was planning to leave him. He knew that she was going to stay with her friend Frida, because she didn't feel safe with him. That only made him more angry. He admits to not meaning to hurt her, but that she made him angry, so it was her fault. That's when the narrator gets a message from Ted. He asks who's reading these messages. This causes her to slam her laptop closed. For a while, she panics, before deciding to go to the police with the screenshots of the messages. A manhunt is started a few days later, though Ted is already gone. He left the house with his keys and wallet. The narrator hopes that the police don't find him, though. If they do, he'll most likely just get life in prison. No, that wasn't what he deserved. He deserved far worse. She was determined to find him first, so she could make him choke on his own blood. Click the link was posted to creepypasta.com in 2015 and was posted by Anonymous. A lot of creepypastas don't have an author and instead were just stories being spread all around online. That was usually what made a good creepypasta. Not knowing the origin always gave it a bit of mystery. The story follows an unnamed narrator who loves horror movies. They used to even wake up in the early mornings as a child just to watch the ones that came on TV. They would usually get caught by their parents, but they would never get punished for it. Fast forward to college and the narrator explains how they love watching horror movies on Netflix. The good, the bad, the really bad. They had seen just about every horror movie on the site which was a lot. They were getting bored of the library and wanted more, but didn't really know where to look. They expressed their frustration on a forum that they browsed with some of their college friends. They all seemed to agree that Netflix's horror section was just not cutting it anymore, especially when you've seen it all. That's when one of their friends, a girl by the screen name of Scream Queen 69 brought up a weird message they'd received. The message was from a user with the screen name behind you, spelled kind of weirdly. They had sent a link over to her and said that she would experience a new kind of horror if she clicked it. She was kind of weirded out because she didn't know this person, so she didn't respond. That's when she got a few more messages, which were pretty mundane, just asking if she'd watched it yet and what she thought. A day later, the group met up on campus and Scream Queen showed them all the messages. The user had sent a repeated phrase hundreds of times. Click the link was repeated with no spaces. This worried everyone, as they were clearly spamming her, but it got worse. She wasn't just getting the messages on the forums, but also on her school email and phone, which they would have no way of knowing. Scream Queen got so many messages, and for so many days in a row, that she was having a hard time sleeping. She would hear the sound of messages on her phone at all times throughout the day. This worried everyone, who tried to block the number and report it, but to no avail. Day and night, those messages would continue. Eventually, they would just show the link with no other text. Two days went by and the author hadn't heard from their friend. Before they could check on her, it was reported by her roommate that they smelled something bad in their dorm room. She was found dead in her room, sitting in her chair in front of her laptop. Sleeping pills, that's what the report said. The narrator didn't buy the story and went to her room to check it out. They went under the guise that they had lent her some stuff and wanted to get it back. While inside her room, the narrator finds her laptop still sitting on the desk and decides to open it. There was no password and the screen flashed to the last thing she'd looked at before passing. It was the same form that they'd all frequented, only she had thousands of messages in front of her. One of them was purple, 
meaning she'd finally caved and clicked the link. The narrator decides to see where the link leads and finds a very dark room that appears on screen. As they lean closer towards the screen, they see posters on the wall, a person sitting on a bed and another behind them, with a wide toothy grin. That's when they make the discovery that the webcam is now on. Funny Mouth is another classic era creepypasta by Slime Beast. Slime Beast has made some of the most well-known stories online, namely the Abandoned by Disney series, which I covered in a previous video. Needless to say, Slime Beast has created some truly creepy tales for the internet. Funny Mouth was uploaded online around 2013. The story would become pretty popular, even winning Creepypasta of the Month. The story would spread all over the internet, but the best place to read it now is on Slime Beast's personal website. Here you can also find other stories that they've created. The story begins with a conversation on a forum. A user named Funny Mouth popped into a chat and started saying weird things. These are what they said. Hello everyone tonight. I like to lick the blood. Out of in the person. I see your handsome face. Don't be so sad about it. Come on, smiley face. They then left the chat. This confused the two chatters. Lemon Lime Skull and Ghost George. Lemon Lime Skull is our narrator for the story. He thinks it's odd that this person would just show up in their chat, stating weird stuff, and then leave. The chat was a forum for helping those with computer issues. They were used to trolls and annoying people popping in to mess with users. They usually just wanted to get a rise out of someone, but Funny Mouth just popped in, said weird stuff, then left. Did you notice that Funny Mouth was in another chat now? Thinking it would be interesting to see what his goal might have been, Lemon follows to the new chat. When he entered, he noticed that it was just him and Funny Mouth in the chat, titled Blood. In the chat, Lemon had a strange conversation with Funny Mouth. Nothing they said made any real sense. They just seemed to be a bit weird. Not in an offensive way or anything, just a little odd. They would also post his emoji a lot. It was likely they were implying that they were watching him. Later that night, Lemon got back on to check and see if anyone else had got on. He entered the chat and saw that everyone was idle, so he was alone on there. He typed a few sentences, hoping to draw someone's attention, but got nothing in response. Then he noticed there was a single message in between his. It was from Funny Mouth, and just like before, he posted the looking at you emoji. It was weird though, because it didn't say Funny Mouth was in the channel. This gave Lemon a strange, I shouldn't have done that feeling as he sat alone by his computer. It was starting to creep him out, which led to him finally deciding to close the program. He messed around on the internet for a few more hours before going to sleep around two in the morning. This is when Lemon says that they never have nightmares. In fact, he's only had four nightmares in his adult life, each that he remembers vividly. He has the ability to lucid dream and force others to live out whatever horror is happening to him in his dreams. The first nightmare he remembers happened in 2005 and he had a dream that his ex was strapped to a medical table while an inexplicable creature sucked her brain out using an organic machine. The second dream had Lemon going to a medical facility that was experimenting with new ways to save lives. This led to a display with three car crash victims who were still alive in disturbing ways. A woman was seen with her face having been almost entirely ripped off and hung loosely around her chest. The third nightmare had two men accosting Lemon, one was poking and pinching him, while the other verbally assaulted him. In his dream, he was able to make the two men turn on each other. This led to one of the men reaching forward and pulling the tongue out of the other man. He then pulled out his eyes until they became grotesque. The current dream that Lemon was having was a recurring one. He laid in a field with trees and a breeze. His eyes were closed in his dreams as he tried to enjoy the weather. Something cold and slimy was squirming on his neck and he pulled at it to find a long earthworm around his neck. Lemon is absolutely disgusted by earthworms and threw the thing away from him. He continued to lay in the serene moment before feeling another one on his neck. He threw this earthworm aside as well. It happened again and this time Lemon woke himself up. He felt around his neck and found something sticky, which he assumed to be drool. He had drooled on himself and that's what caused those weird dreams. Something weirder was happening though. On his bed, 
There were four indents. Looking as if someone had been on all fours looking over him. This scared him more than the dream ever could, and he became a light sleeper following that night. Lemon awoke the next day and decided to check his email before heading out for the day. He saw that he had an email from Funny Mouth. The email read, I had a good time to talk to you. It can be fun again. You'll see what. I don't like stop it. Lemon had never given Funny Mouth his email. It could have been one of the others, but he didn't know who. He didn't want to talk to him, and after a short back and forth, he ends up blocking him. With that all done, he headed out for the day. After a while, he came back and checked his email again. Nothing from Funny Mouth. Of course, he had blocked him. But he did have one email. It was from George. Apparently, their website had gone down. Lemon checked the website and saw that it redirected to blood.com. The only thing on the website was a blurry image of a man with his tongue out in a strange way. The face was pixelated and hard to make out. When he told George about this, he said that all he saw was an error 404 page, with coming soon at the bottom. That didn't make sense. He was looking at the page right now. It was that weird face. A screenshot of the error 404 was sent by George, and that confused things even more. While examining the website, he noticed that the face wasn't pixelated at all. It was created from the word funny mouth, over and over again. This was really starting to irritate him. So much so that he unblocked funny mouth to ask him what he'd done to the site. As soon as he did, a torrent of emails came in from him. They all said similar things, but a recurring mention of having a handsome face was the most blatant. He finally told him to stop and sent a very kind email asking him to undo whatever he did to his site. This was met with the same looking at you emoji from before. This sent Lemon reeling. He was so angry he slapped his monitor. It flew off his desk, but luckily didn't break. That night, he stared at his ceiling fan trying to sleep. He would eventually go under and be met with the same woods as the night before. He knew what to expect, but as the slimy feeling approached his neck, he didn't bother to throw it aside. Then it creeped up towards his mouth. He tried to will himself awake, but couldn't. He felt the thing worm its way into his mouth. This is when he noticed that it wasn't a worm. It was actually a finger, then two, then four. The hand clutched his lower jaw and pulled downward. With a pop, his jaw was dislocated. This is when he was able to finally force himself awake. He rushed towards the bathroom and turned on the light. He stared into the mirror for a minute. No reaction, no feeling whatsoever. Then he smiled. Well, as best he could. His jaw was completely broken, hanging around his neck. His tongue lolled out listlessly, like a dead worm. His teeth were no longer rooted to his mouth, and instead just hung on by threads of flesh. He started to laugh. It came out more like a gurgle. What a handsome face, he thought. What a funny mouth. Funny mouth. A funny mouth. Lemon rejoined the chat and typed, I see your handsome face. George responded, Hey, where have you been? Hey, Charles? A message appeared on screen. Lemon Lime Skull is now known as Funny Mouth. A final use of the looking at you emoji appeared before Funny Mouth left the channel. Necrosleep is one of the most well-known internet-based creepypastas. The story was uploaded in 2014 and written by Lemniscate64. Necrosleep is about a man's blog and his attempts at never sleeping again. The story is told through the blog posts of a man named Reed Murdoch. His first post was on October 16th, 2014, with the title being My Disconnected Life. In this first post, he introduces himself, explains that he's just moved out of his parents' basement and is now trying to live his life in a crappy apartment. The apartment consists of a living room, kitchenette, a bathroom, and a closet. Even with so little, the upsides aren't so terrible. Reed says his expenses are so low that he can make enough to cover rent and food by simply doing random tasks online. He fills out surveys for political issues he knows nothing about and writes reviews for items he's never used. He made enough to live off of and even got to stay inside, which was a huge plus. He'd always been a bit of a recluse. This was the end of his first blog post. He says that he will be updating it every day or two. It wouldn't take longer than two days before his next post. 
It would go up on October 18th. The post starts with Reed telling the readers his plans. He's updating the blog at 3 a.m., and this is for good reason. He's planning to shift to a full nocturnal sleep schedule. His reasons for doing so are pretty simple. Better internet after midnight, less people out, sunlight gives you cancer, and it's a free country, so social norms be damned. His final reasoning is because of a new form he found called Nocturnal Underground. The forum was comprised of people that hated the daytime and recluses. It was a tight-knit community that preferred the internet after dark. Which, as he reminds his readers multiple times, the internet is more interesting after dark. The next post came on October 21st and it seemed that Reed was getting accustomed to his new nocturnal lifestyle. There was one weird thing though. He'd received an odd message from an email named Revelation666. This is that email in full. To Readman07 from Revelation666, subject necrosleep.net. Congratulations, Readman07. You've been invited to an invitation-only website that will change your life forever. Discover what society doesn't want you to know at necrosleep.net. Use your exclusive invitation code to enter, DCLXVI. Find out what you've been missing your entire life, necrosleep.net. Weirded out but also intrigued, Reed continued to the site. The page came up blank, but he found out that he could type in the middle. He inputted the invitation code he received and found a very odd-looking website. The website was in Russian, but luckily his browser auto-translated it for him. It was a pretty shady and generic looking site. The font was Courier, it looked more like Notepad than a website, and the background was just black with white text. Here's an excerpt from the main page. Welcome to Necrosleep.net. This website is invitation only. Selected visitors have exclusive access to our special product that will change your life forever. Necrosleep is a product that safely negates the biological necessity of sleep, thanks to our miraculous secret formula. With one pill a day, you will never feel the need to sleep again. Try it for yourself by clicking the purchase link. If Necrosleep doesn't change your life, we will offer you a complete refund. Your astonishment is guaranteed. The text continued. Necrosleep is comprised of special and rare ingredients, which we cannot disclose in order to ensure that our formula stays in private hands. In order to keep our product available, it can only be distributed through alternative means on an exclusive basis. The active ingredients in Necrosleep has been sought after for years by doctors and scientists intending to displace sleep with wakefulness. Only we have managed to do what others could not, as permitted by the will of our master. We can assure you with full confidence that our product will change your life. You will never feel the need to sleep again. Feel free to indulge in our secret. It was clear that whatever they were selling was illegal. He clearly didn't care for the law, as he frequently used illicit substances. The whole vibe just felt wrong. A section titled Credit caught Reed's eye. After clicking on it, Reed was met with a tall man in a lab coat. If the man wasn't standing up straight, you'd think he was dead. He was gaunt with a blurry look in his eyes. He was credited with creating Necrosleep. That is what the site said. Credit for the pioneering of Necrosleep goes to the brilliant Dr. Hale A. Stan, proxy of our master and founder of the Ukrainian Institute of Occult Medicine. His work lives on. Occult medicine was a phrase that really made Reed question exactly what he was looking at. Even so, he clicked the purchase link out of curiosity. He then found another reason not to purchase the pills. They were $130 US per pill. It wasn't like he was going to try them before, but that was a crazy amount. We cut to the next post and Reed has started a thread on Nocturnal Underground to see if anyone else has heard of Necrosleep. The chat was pretty lively as soon as he posted. A back and forth between five members ensued. They all told them basically the same thing though, not to trust the website or the product. They also were all pretty intrigued though, and asked for screenshots. It turned out that the website could only be seen if you were invited. This meant that none of them could enter it, and so he went back and grabbed screenshots for them. This cemented their stance on not continuing the search of the website. A day later, Reed received a message from an admin. They said that there was no user with the name provided. The only way they could have sent a message to him was if they bypassed the client somehow. This meant they had to hack the site just to send him spam. The next post had Reed doing some independent research on what Necrosleep might be. He found old YouTube videos, a few garage bands, and a post from fastmd.com. The post was deleted, of course. His search eventually led him to an old gaming forum. Someone was asking if anyone had tried Necrosleep yet. 
He was thinking about trying it so he could stay awake longer and work on his virtual farm, on some obscure medieval strategy game. No one had any idea what he was talking about. They said that the site didn't exist or didn't work, for the same reason that it hadn't for the others in the community. The site did give out the same code though, at least this person had the same exact code as the one he'd received. He ended up taking the pills and showed the progress of his crops. It was insanely far ahead of where he'd been prior, in a way that was almost impossible unless he didn't need to sleep. The forum's admins banned him for botting his farm, still not believing him in the end. A few days later, Reed received another PM from Revelation 666. This is what the message said. To Reedman07, from Revelation 666. Subject, necrosleep.net forward slash backdoor. Congratulations, Reedman07. You've been selected to receive a free 30-day trial of Necrosleep. Claim your exclusive reward at necrosleep.net forward slash backdoor. Find out what you've been missing your entire life, risk-free. Necrosleep.net forward slash backdoor. Read uploaded this email to another thread on the forum. He was met with concerns and groans that he shouldn't trust it. He did say that he ordered the pills to a P.O. box and was just curious if it was a scam or not. If the pills arrived, he would promised that he wouldn't try them unless he found out they were safe from another source. The other members, including an admin, stated their concerns again, but were also curious about the pills. Reed told them that he was done updating this thread and would be posting everything on his blog if they were interested. With that, he signed off for the night. It turned out not to be a prank by the admins, like he assumed for a minute. Only time would tell if he even received the pills or not. On the 30th of October, he updated his blog again. He had received the pills, 30 of them, tiny black capsules of necrosleep. The envelope with the pills had no return label and was rather fishy looking. The blank envelope had a smaller envelope on the inside. The word necrosleep was written on it, as well as storing instructions. They needed to be stored in a cool, dark place for maximum potency. On the 31st of October, Reed began research into the creator of necrosleep, Dr. Hale A. Stan. He actually had a Wikipedia page dedicated to him. He was a Soviet researcher from Ukraine that conducted experiments where he tried to revive, or keep alive, decapitated animals. He was later sentenced to prison for conducting these experiments on live human subjects. Further evidence into his crimes would lead to him being executed through lethal injection. This was a turning point for Reed. Up until this point, he just thought this was a spam email from someone trying to scam his credit card. What it turned into was a chance to change his life. He believed that he was chosen for a reason. The next day, he posts this to his blog. November 1st, 2014. I'm holding the pill in my hand, ready to take it at a moment's notice. I've been thinking hard about this. I know it's not the safest thing to do, but I'm a risk taker. If this turns out badly, I don't have much to live for anyway. Life is nothing without danger, and I want to know the motives of these people more than anything. I need to know what they want from me. I need to know what I'm missing. There's only one way to find out. Two days later, he would come back. November 3rd, 2014. I can't believe it. It's actually working. I haven't slept in three days, and I don't even feel remotely tired. Holy hell, I never felt so focused and stimulated in my life. I don't know what's in this stuff, but it works. I don't know how long it's going to work exactly, so I'm not getting my hopes up. But the claim is that I'll never need to sleep again. Ever. So far, so good. Reed continues with another blog post, saying that four days on, the pills are still working. He hasn't needed to sleep at all. He feels so much more productive. The only downside is his new aversion to light. The sunlight coming through the window gave him migraines, so he covered them with cardboard and duct tape. There was a symbol on the inside of the envelope and it scared Reed enough to consider stopping the pills. The next day, about 30 minutes after when he'd normally take his pill, he got a massive headache. He held off for an hour before he got to the point that he needed to take them again, and so he did. Even with the aversion to light, Reed was seeing some upsides to the pills. He was remarkably more productive he was better with numbers for some reason, and actually making a killing with online gambling. He felt more awake than he ever had before. The downside also started to show themselves at this point. The first odd occurrence was with a reflective set of eyes that appeared out of nowhere. He focused on them for a little bit before looking down at his cat. When he looked back up, they were gone. Reed comes to a terrible realization that he's going to need to get food soon. The thought scared him for some reason. He's never liked going out, but never feared it before. None of his friends were answering his messages, so it was likely he'd have to go out at some point. 
One of his friends finally responded. Jake agreed to get his food as long as he came out to club with them. They hadn't seen him in a while and were starting to get worried. He refused. The idea of leaving his house, his safe abode, terrified him more and more every day. Reed had another strange experience. He now had his TV on in the background at all times. He really needed the white noise. This helped a bit with the weird feeling he got from always being awake. A show called Bucko's Garden was on TV. It was a kid's show that he remembered enjoying until he got old enough to realize it was all mindless and nonsensical. At one point, he found himself in a trance staring at the TV. It was a Thanksgiving-themed episode, which made sense given the time of year. The usual stuff was happening. Talking animals getting the supplies for supper, talking to the camera, some happy-go-lucky music playing, the usual. The show was the usual nonsense, until Bucko reached into the oven. He pulled out a human fetus and slapped it onto the table. This grossed out Reed enough to look away from the TV. He couldn't believe that this was allowed on TV. Reed was starting to feel that he couldn't trust his eyes. He felt that he had to do a double take on everything he was seeing. He forgot his PC login multiple times. He changed it, wrote it down, and then forgot where he wrote it down. Things were getting progressively worse as he saw eyes everywhere. He walked into the bathroom to take a shower and saw something staring at him through his mirror. It stood behind him, staring perfectly still. When he turned around, he saw nothing. This is the first time that he considered the pills were screwing with his mind. He started to hear voices, all day, every day. The voices told him things. Things that he should do. Things that he shouldn't do. It was all he knew. Every second of every day was filled with the voices. They wanted him to do something, but he didn't know if he could. The story takes a bit of a shift from here, as instead of reading Reed's blog, we're instead reading a police report. Reed had been shot and killed while attacking his father. He had ripped the man's head open and was starting to eat his brain tissue. He was warned multiple times to stop before police took the shot. An autopsy revealed that there was a microscopic black parasite that was eating away at his brain. The type of parasite they were was unknown at the time of the autopsy. The pills that he had been taking were tested and found to be the source of the parasites. There were eggs that would hatch when digested. The source of the pills was ascertained, but the website turned out to not exist. To this day, officials have no idea where he got those pills, or what necrosleep could even mean. Necrosleep is a pasta that I think serves as one of the best in the internet computer subgenre. It hits all the notes perfectly to create an engaging, semi-believable, and unnerving story. Looking a little deeper could break that immersion, but it's not so much supernatural, rather a little out there. The few mentions of satanic imagery was kind of cheesy, but didn't take me out of the story. I will say that I would have liked a bit more on what the parasites could have been. It felt to me like a story in a series, like there were supposed to be other stories related to it, and this was just one of them. If you're up for a late night read, this story is an excellent place to take a dive into internet creepypastas. Actually, I recommend you specifically read this story when the sun has already gone down and you're all alone. It really enhances the story. I Have Thin Walls is a story posted originally on No Sleep in 2014. It would be posted to the Creepypasta Wiki later in 2018. The story is written by Alex Isaacs and starts with an unnamed narrator telling us he always planned to sleep by midnight but always stayed up until 3 a.m. He would spend his time on the internet like most of those that prefer to be nocturnal. He would watch videos, browse forums, do whatever. He always had a pair of headphones on and cherished the moment when he would finally take them off. It was the most freeing experience to him because he always made his ears sore. As he removed his headphones, that's when he heard voices. He lived in an apartment with thin walls, so hearing his neighbors was nothing new. It was 3 a.m. and both of his neighbors worked at 4, so they got up around this time to start their day. He hated how loud they were. He could hear them doing everything. The narrator is a pretty light sleeper, and they would always wake him up. This is why he had some sleeping pills in his bathroom cabinet. He got up to go get them, but just as he left the room, the voices stopped. Maybe he wouldn't need them after all, and went back to his room. As soon as he laid down, he heard the voices again. They sounded quieter, more muffled. He got back up to grab the pills, and as soon as he left the room, the same thing happened. Complete silence and no voices. 
The narrator grabbed the pills and headed back to bed. He sat for a second and waited. The voices started up again. He decided that he would just take the pills and go to sleep. He turned to unplug his laptop, first unplugging the headphones. The voices stopped. Realization set in. It was actually Sunday. Neither of his neighbors worked today. The voices appeared to be coming from his laptop. He opened it and checked to see what could have been playing, but saw nothing. He began to panic as he plugged his headphones back in and put them on. The narrator tried to listening to what the voices were saying. A browser opened on his PC, startling him. It went straight to a website. At least, he thought it was a website. The voices started to speak more clearly now. It sounded like two or more people were talking. He doesn't know yet, one of the voices said. He will in a little bit, give it time, another replied. I think he is catching on, said a third. He'll have no choice but to join us. Curiosity always gets the better of humans. Now, start it now. The screen flickered to life and a video began. The narrator was startled again, as he was staring at a human face that he thought was his own, but no, it wasn't. The voices told him that they can see him and that he can respond to them. Can he see me? asked the narrator. No, only hear you, one of the voices replied. The person was just like the narrator had been. He wore headphones and appeared to be reading or examining something really closely. So closely that he wouldn't notice the voices speaking softly. Here is an excerpt from the end of the story. We don't see him yet, said one of the voices. We can only see you. Can you tell us when he finally realizes where the voices are coming from? He doesn't know yet, I said. He will in a little bit. Give him time, said one of the voices. I think he is catching on, said another. I Have Thin Walls is a pretty unique story. The idea of being watched by others while browsing the internet is a real fear that many have. Somehow hearing voices so low that they become background noise as well is a great use of a creep factor. The ending of the story makes it seem like it's a never-ending cycle of finding people that watch others. Every time someone new is found, they only notice the voices as whispers. As soon as they recognize the voices, they are then free to join them. Honestly, I wasn't too scared by the story. I like the concept a bit, and as someone who has a fear of being watched, this kind of works for me. The one line that kind of makes me curious is the line about humans. Are these beings that are watching not humans? If not, then what exactly is watching us through our computers? And moreover, why does it want others to watch along with them? The SCP Foundation is making their first appearance on this iceberg. There are quite a few internet technology-based stories that can be found on the wiki. The one that most interests me is SCP-1471. Here's a brief description of the SCP. SCP-1471 is a 9.8 megabyte application for mobile devices named Mallow version 1.0.0 in online application stores. SCP-1471 has no listed developer and is somehow able to bypass the application process to go directly to distribution. SCP-1471 is also able to avoid removal by other program manager applications. After SCP-1471 is installed, no icons or shortcuts are created for the application. SCP-1471 will then begin to send the individual images through text messaging every 3 to 6 hours. All images will contain SCP-1471 Alpha, either within the background or foreground. SCP-1471 Alpha appears as a large humanoid figure with a canid-like skull and black hair. During the first 24 hours following the installation of SCP-1471, the mobile device will receive images taken at locations commonly frequented by the individual. After 48 hours, the mobile device will receive images taken at locations that were recently visited by the individual. After 72 hours, the mobile device will receive images of the individual in real time with SCP-1471 Alpha appearing within close proximity to the subject. Individuals with greater than 90 hours of exposure to these continuous images will begin to briefly visualize SCP-1471 Alpha within their peripheral vision, reflective surfaces, or a combination of the two. Continued exposure to SCP-1471 after this point will cause irreversible and sustained visualizations of SCP-1471 Alpha. Individuals at this stage have reported periodic attempts made by SCP-1471 Alpha to visually communicate with them, but fail to understand or comprehend these actions. Currently the only known treatment to reverse SCP-1471's effects 
is to eliminate the individual's visual exposure to these images prior to 90 hours after installation. To date, no apparent hostile activity has been reported regarding SCP-1471 Alpha. This is essentially an SCP that haunts any person that comes into contact with their app. The app can be found on any app store, and if you were to run into it, this would be what the description says. 4. Redacted Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mallow will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. It's important to note that SCP-1471 Alpha has never been seen acting aggressively towards anyone. This does not mean that you should seek the app out. The motivations of 1471 Alpha are still unknown to this day. ThreeQuestions.net is a story that comes from Reddit, but not from the usual places. This story comes from the Clancy Pasta Reddit page, which is dedicated to a fellow YouTuber and horror narrator, Clancy Pasta. The story received a little attention on Reddit, but gained a decent viewership on YouTube. The story starts with our narrator named Jonathan, explaining that he had a very gullible friend. His friend's name was Thomas, and he was about as gullible as you can get. He would always go onto websites that stated he'd won something, or that promised secrets to questions he had. As far as that went, he would usually walk away with a virus, one that Jonathan would have to clean from his computer later. This was the extent of their friendship. Jonathan found him annoying, but overall not a bad guy. He just let himself fall for just about anything. While eating lunch one day, Jonathan is interrupted by Thomas. He says that he found a really interesting website that John had to check out. The website was called 3questions.net. It was simple, really. You ask a bot on this website three questions, all of which will be answered truthfully, and then the bot asks a question in return. There was a catch to the question, though. You had to answer the question the bot asked truthfully, and correctly, or else bad things will happen to you. This was something ominous, but John doubted that a bot could really do anything to harm him. John also doubted that this website wasn't just some Trojan virus, trying to steal his credit card numbers or backdoor his computer. This is something that has happened before, thanks to another website that Thomas had him check out. The day ended and the boys went their separate ways. John got home, ate some spaghetti his mom made, and then went up to his room. He spent his time browsing YouTube and other sites until he was bored of it all. The thought of 3questions.net came to his mind, and he finally decided that he might just indulge his friend. John logged into the website, which turned out to be very simple. It had a chat box and some rules written next to it. You had to number the questions and you only got to ask three. It was essentially what Thomas had explained at school. John started to type in the chat box. A response came in from Anonymous R. It read, Hi, I'm the question bot, and any question you ask will be answered with accuracy and efficiency. Now, what is your first question? The way the bot typed was weird. Could it really answer any question correctly? That seemed beyond believable. Even more so, when John asked how it knew these questions, it answered that it knew everyone and everything. Fine. The first question from John said, How well do you know me, stupid bot? The bot responded nearly immediately. Anonymous R. You're Jonathan Reese Baker, 18 years old, currently living on 14 Pinewood Drive with your mother, Mary Baker. Your father went missing 10 years ago, and you still hold on to his last letter to you, wishing for the day when he would come back and tell you where he has been even though I'm afraid he cannot do that anymore. Your best friend is Thomas Sheridan, and he has talked to me yesterday. But I'm afraid to say that he has precisely 3 minutes 50 seconds ago failed to answer my question correctly, and... John slammed his laptop closed. There was no way this bot could know this much about him. Yet it did. And all of that was correct. He was too afraid to open his laptop for the rest of the night. The next day at school, John didn't see Thomas in class. That's when he heard from the authorities what happened. Thomas was dead. His body had been found in his room, bloody and mangled. They had no idea what had happened to him. There was also his laptop, which had been completely destroyed. The only lead they had to go off of was the laptop, 
which they believed had exploded and that's what had killed Thomas. John had just remembered what the bot had said. Thomas had answered the question wrong. Could he have been killed by the bot? He raced home from school, turned on his laptop, continued back to the site. John asked the bot why it killed Thomas. The answer he got was the one he expected. It killed him because he answered the question wrong. In anger, John asked his final question. Can you prove to me that you're real? The response came in. I can try. The bot left the session and John sat there in silence. There was an unease in the air, but he wasn't sure what to expect really. He heard his mother calling him down to dinner. Brushing his feelings aside, he got up and headed downstairs. As he descended the stairs, he saw his mom. Wait, that wasn't his mother. Her eyes were pitch black and she spoke to him in a different voice. Now, Jonathan Reese Baker, it is time for you to answer my question. I'm always watching you, never faltering, always knowing I am the reaper of souls, the all-knowing being, the judge of your fate. I am your God. Who am I? John screamed out the first thing that came to his mind. You're Lucifer the devil, he said. The thing smiled and said yes. It wished him a good day before leaving his mom's body. She crumbled to the ground in a heap. It was clear that she didn't survive the possession. John gives one final warning about 3questions.net. If you ever find the website, do not go and ask it questions. You will not like the answers you get. You will not like the questions you get asked. 3questions.net is kind of a hard story to talk about. On one hand, I like the premise of a bot answering questions for you. I don't really enjoy the execution and I'm not a huge fan of the devil being used here. The devil is a frequent character in my ritual pasta iceberg, so I've seen enough of him to last me a lifetime. The story here lacks a lot of things that make a good creepypasta. The buildup isn't there and the ending lacks luster. The reading of this story by Clancy Pasta is great though, so if you want to experience this story for yourself, check out his channel. It does a better job of telling the story than the actual post does. Findagrave.com is a short creepypasta posted to the wiki in 2012. The story focuses around the real website findagrave.com. We'll talk about the website after the story. Findagrave.com opens with a narrator saying that they were screwing around at school. Instead of working on the PowerPoint they were supposed to finish, they were looking through the website links on their school's homepage. One website caught their eye, and it was called www.findagrave.com. The website confused them, but they clicked on it anyway. It was a simple website with a very interesting premise. It's a website that allows you to look at deceased individuals' grave records. This included when they died and a picture of their gravestone. This is super weird. Who had taken a picture of all these gravestones, he thought. The narrator went home and told their mom about the site. Their mom waved her off, clearly not taking it too seriously. They asked her mother who took the photo of their great-grandma's gravestone, but she had no idea. Later that night, the narrator decides to go to the website again. All of their internet friends had gone to sleep and no one was around to keep them company. It was getting late, but they'd made a poor choice and drank an entire liter of coke and now couldn't sleep even if they wanted to. They browsed the site more in depth than they had at school, looking for the names of celebrities that had passed, close relatives, and the like. This is when they decided to look up their own name, which is never a good idea. The narrator typed in their name and looked at the results. People with similar names popped up to be exact. They were all in states relatively close to the one they lived in. They had all died before the narrator was born, but with each page they explored, the date got closer. Eventually they refreshed the page and found that there was actually five results now. Curiously, they continued to the fifth page. The birth year was the same as theirs. Next to the birth year was tomorrow's date. The included photo was a picture of them in their room with someone standing behind them in the darkness. Findagrave.com is a pretty standard creepypasta. It's quick to tell its story and move on to the surprise ending. Now, the website that it's referring to actually exists. It's a website where you can search the death records of those that have been submitted to the site. It's kind of unnerving to see images of the deceased on the website like this. Some of the deceased have images of their gravestones, while others will have images of themselves. It's kind of a morbid curiosity, but the website says that it exists in order to honor those that have passed. The story was fine in most cases, though a little cliche in others. I find it still a fun read to find browsing the internet late into the night.
Read this before the authorities take it down as a story that was posted onto the Clancy Pasta subreddit in 2018. The story was written by Lord Colbito and has a man coming to terms with the fact that he knows too much. The story starts with the narrator talking about his searches for something. What he is specifically looking for isn't mentioned. What he does mention is that the NSA has hacked his computer seven times in the last 10 years, leading him to hopping from hotel to motel to campsites. He mustn't be caught by the US government and needs to know the answers to every question he has. The narrator's search for answers through the medium of the internet started back in 2003. The internet was young then, less widely used, and far less commercially so. They claimed to have been a member of a forum that knew a little too much about the world. In such, the server was taken down by the government. Many of the members were hushed with non-disclosure agreements and others are rotting away in secret government prisons. This is when the narrator describes an image he found, the one that really started all of this. Even though everyone he tried to tell has called him a schizophrenic, he says it's all real. You just have to believe him. The photo in question was of a woman giving birth to an alien-like creature. The image was clearly a still from a video, one that he didn't have access to. Underneath the image were other members of the forums, all reacting to it. Some were in disbelief that a creature like that could exist. That was the popular take as others weighed in with their lack of understanding of what it could be. Even still, there were others that claimed Photoshop was the culprit. The narrator stayed in that discussion all night. He sifted through thousands of comments. There was even one from a troll pretending to be a rogue member of the central government. He claimed that they were experimenting where humans were mixed with the DNA of the remains of the aliens from the Roswell incident. This is what led to the creatures seen in the image. While the narrator was skeptical at first, he now believes that he may have been right. Continuing through the thread, there was even a journalist from the Boston Globe. They claimed they were going to write an article titled, Internet Mystery, Hoax or Highlight? Though this story would never see the light of day, which is to be expected with what he knew now. The original thread was deleted. A new thread was created by the same poster, and soon that thread was also deleted. Every time a new one would go up, it would just as quickly be removed. Five minutes had passed, and the entire forum no longer existed. It was gone as if it never had existed. The next day, the narrator got a phone call from a strange number. They were told to report to the FBI office in Chelsea, Massachusetts. They were told to check their email. The address would be inside, he was told. He turned on his computer and saw two emails. The first was from the FBI member in Chelsea. It listed where the building was, as well as the detours they needed to take in order to avoid the massive snowstorm currently outside. The second email was from an address named 4chan.anon666 at rocketmail.com. The email read, To whom it may concern, do not turn yourself in, for they plan to arrest you upon arrival. Pack as much as you can and escape by boat. If you cross into Mexico or Canada, the marshals will still find you. If you are reading this, then you are on the no-fly list. Run. Of course, he didn't want to believe some random person that had found his email online, but for some reason, he did. Much to the chagrin of his parents, since his childhood therapist diagnosed him with delusional disorder and paranormal schizophrenia, they were wrong, of course. The narrator claimed to believe the email for one specific reason. As he'd finished reading it, dots of lights appeared outside of his window. Clearly, the government was already watching him. He packed a few belongings under the watch of the strange lights and headed towards Canada. His plan was to make it to Canada, then fly out of there towards the Dominican Republic. There he would be safe from the U.S. government. The plan had failed, though, since he's actually on the Canadian no-fly list as well. This has led to him hiding away in Canada, while the U.S. and Canadian authorities try to find him. The narrator believes that even if he escapes the authorities, he knows that those lights will continue to follow him. No matter where he goes, he is being watched. His only hope is to spread his story to as many places as possible, in hopes that it becomes a copy pasta. The text will be taken down by the government, undoubtedly. That's why he hopes to spread it to as many places as possible so that everyone can know that these creatures exist, that the government doesn't want us to find out. This story follows a lot of your usual government conspiracy stories. For that, I actually like it a lot. The most interesting part to me, though, is that the original story is now deleted, as is the user that posted it. Touches like that, outside of the story itself, really make my enjoyment of the story that much more.
Why I Never Used Street View on Google Maps is a story that was uploaded to the No Sleep subreddit in 2021. The story was written by Pickle Jar Potatoes and is another story that uses Google Maps as its premise. There are a few of these stories, namely Satellite Images, Google Maps 3D, and Apple Maps. The two latter stories we'll be covering later on in this iceberg. This particular subgenre of internet-based creepypasta is one that I've slowly started to love. I used to be someone who would browse Google Maps when I was bored. I even played GeoGuessr a few times. I'm surprised no one has made a creepypasta about that yet. The story opens with the poster claiming that they never use the Street View function on Google Maps anymore. When he has to explain to his friends why he doesn't, usually he states that he likes to see things for himself first. The poster continues to when he'd first found out about Google Maps. He was playing games on his school computer, specifically Fireboy and Watergirl on CoolMathGames.com. This is when one of his friends asked him if he's ever heard of Google Maps. Yeah, my parents use it all the time, he replied. But did you know you can actually see the places on the map? Like you were actually there, his friend replied. The two 12-year-olds talked about it for a second before deciding to try the Street View feature for themselves. The poster's friend asked where he wanted to look, and he said why not check out the school. His friend groaned before complying and dropping the little figure near their school. The school looked just like it did in real life. The poster was mesmerized by the images before him. He could see the broken swings on the playground and everything. His friend then dropped the figure on his own address. He could see his friend's house, and it almost felt like he was actually there. Everything was exactly as it was, true to reality. After school, the poster rushed home and continued on with his day. He played flash games with a snack from the pantry and found that he was starting to get bored. His parents wouldn't be home until late, so he really didn't need to get off his computer anytime soon. Google Maps came to his mind. It was something that he found to be really interesting, especially the Street View feature. This time he would search up his own address and see what his house looked like. The poster input his address and dropped the man on his street. It came up like it did at school. It happened to look just like his home. The details were exactly right, except there was something off. Around his side gate, there was a man in a hoodie. He tried to zoom in on his face, but found that he could only see the back of his head. The side gate led into the backyard, and that was starting to unnerve him. The poster got up from his chair and was starting to freak himself out. He ran to the side window and looked out. There wasn't anyone there, naturally. Why would there be? He came back to the computer and jump scared himself. The man's face was now taking up the entire screen. He had a cartoonishly large smile and bulging eyes. The worst part, though, is he never zoomed the camera up to his face like that. Zooming out instantly, the rest of the man's body was now in view. He was tall and lanky, but crooked. He didn't seem normal. It was close, but slightly off. It was off in a way that many would call uncanny. The Street View images stated that they had all been taken months ago, so there was no way this man stood outside right now. The poster kept trying to reason with himself that there was no way. He got up to check again, and once again there was no one. Turning to his computer, the man moved again. This time he was staring directly at the screen with his hand out of his hoodie pocket. The hand was in a thumbs down gesture. The smile widened. It was inhuman. Fearing the man would move again, the poster didn't take his eyes off the screen. A wicked blue appeared on the screen. The computer had decided for him. It was the blue screen of death, and the only fix was to unplug the PC. He restarted it, hoping that the man hadn't moved in his time away from Google Maps. It booted with the old Windows XP logo. It was taking too long. The man could be there by now. As it loaded, the sound of jiggling from his front door shook him to his core. He froze. There was no way he could be safe in his room, not if the man could get through his locked front door so easily. The jiggling intensified, and his heart could be heard in his ears. Just as he started to close his door, he heard his mom announce that they were home. He ran downstairs to hug both of his parents, and then dragged them upstairs to show them Google Maps. He loaded back into their street and saw that there was no one there. It just showed their house, like it normally would. This story does an excellent job building the tension of what might be lurking outside. This isn't anything new as we've heard the same type of story told before. I do like the way this one is told though, through the lens of a child. Children tend to scare themselves more with little to go on. I was like this when I was a child. I had a very overactive imagination, which made creepypasta as the perfect story type for me. Being scared with the bare minimum to go off of is kind of my whole thing. I just like to imagine something getting closer. Something that can only be seen through the lens of Google. Something that makes its way towards your door. It's just something to think about.
Chat Room 98 is the next story on the iceberg. It's one that I feel I've heard many times before. The story is about a man named David that finds a CD-ROM with a strange program on it named Chat Room 98. The story was published to the Creepypasta Wiki in 2011 by Snevitz. There isn't an author attached to the story, but it isn't listed as anonymous either. The whole story takes place in England. The Creepypasta opens with David saying that he's doing some cleaning. He's just finishing his degree and was ready to throw away all the useless homework and other stuff that he had no use for anymore. It was supposed to be a cathartic experience, but instead he finds a jewel case amongst his stuff. There was a CD-ROM on the inside with the words, Chat Room 98, written on them in black marker. This was odd as most chat rooms didn't come in this format. They were usually browser-based or downloadable at the very least. Curiosity got the better of him and he popped the CD into his computer. It booted up fine and he found himself with a very primitive looking red box chat room. The words Welcome to Chat Room 98 appeared on screen and he typed in the available space. Hello. A response came quickly. Good afternoon. The message came from a user named Darwin Clark. It appeared to be a real person, at least on the surface. That didn't seem possible though. This was a CD-ROM with a very unknown chat room program. Could another person actually be using this? He concluded that it was most likely a bot. Also. Also, it was just dawning on him, where did this disc even come from? He had lived in his house for six years now and had no idea why or how it ended up in his things. The previous owners must have left it behind. He started the chat with, lovely weather we're having. The bot responded, no, it seems rather miserable today. That was odd. The weather actually wasn't that great outside. It appeared to be about to rain. This could still be a coincidence. He lived in England after all. Rain was practically the norm there. David shook it off and asked another question. So what are your favorite movies? A pretty innocuous question. Another response appeared on screen. I prefer the theater. This is a weird bot, but it didn't respond in a way that really gave away what it could be. The questions continued with the bot saying that it was born in 1867 and hated its two sisters. David responded by saying his name was Jesus and that he had two brothers that were aliens. The bot seemed to humor him, but then it changed its tone. It said it had done something terrible to its two sisters, which David continued to joke with it, asking if it knew what his brothers had done lately. You were an only child, David, it responded. This is when David knew that it wasn't just some simple bot. It knew things, and it was telling the story of what happened to its sisters. It described what had happened. Finally, it typed, look behind you. David did so and was relieved to see nothing. When he turned back around, there was a face on screen. It stared at him with malice. He fell backwards in his chair and fell unconscious. David continued his story. Apparently he was now in the hospital. He had passed out, and when he came to, he was in a hospital bed. He had no recollection of how he got there, though. He was writing this story on a laptop that he was able to borrow. David complains of a headache that he feels now might be permanent. He was on loads of painkillers, but nothing seemed to help. He was now finishing uploading this story around 4.30 in the morning, which he said, as soon as he was done uploading it, he was going to find an open window on the third floor. He couldn't take this headache anymore. Chatroom 98 is a story that I didn't find very interesting. It was one that I've heard many times before, but something about reading it instead of hearing it made it less interesting. The whole plot takes a weird turn and it's not very scary. I feel like it could have been written a bit better as well. The whole ending and even before that with the face on screen just didn't invoke the kind of terror that the author likely hoped it would. It just wasn't built up properly to have that fear factor. Keep him laughing.wmv is a pasta that was uploaded to the wiki in 2013. It was uploaded by Turbo Swag and is an interesting time capsule of the year it came out. It makes mentions of Windows 8's tablet-like layout and other things. The story begins with a guy named Cody, who explains that he is the guy that you've seen that appears to be glued to his laptop. He takes it everywhere with him, to bed, to the dinner table, and just about everywhere. Though now, he doesn't even own a laptop. Three months prior to this story's upload, he got a new laptop. It wasn't anything special, just your run-of-the-mill laptop. He got it for cheap. He even got Windows 8 on it, which he would later revert to 7 with the help of a friend. Nothing was wrong with the laptop. It was as clean a start for it as you could have, which is why he was so caught off guard when he got a pop-up while searching the web. It wasn't the usual, you were the millionth visitor or anything like that. 
It actually appeared to be something completely different. It was an ad for a comedy show. The ad claimed to be a virus that infected the computer with the worst comedy known to man. It was apparently a comedy talk show hosted by two men, Jason and Dan. The faux virus led to the website, where you could download the episodes that released on a weekly basis. Cody decided to give the show a watch and found that he actually enjoyed their comedy style. It had the two hosts running skits, sitting on a couch interviewing people, and other comedy staples. The two played off each other very well, and he was finding himself becoming a fan pretty quickly. A new episode was scheduled to be released. Knowing this, Cody rushed home after class to download it. The episode was titled Keep Him Laughing.wmv. He sat in front of his laptop and clicked the episode. The episode had a different tone than the others. Dan, one of the hosts, was acting strange. He wasn't really talking for most of the bits, and the episode was mostly just Jason making jokes. In the middle of the sketch, Dan just walks off camera without a word. It was strange, as it seemed that it wasn't a bit. Jason had no idea why his co-host left, and decided to follow. Off screen there was a scream, and Jason ran back into the center, with a red patch on his shoulder. Dan followed him back on screen and knocked him to the ground. Jason started to beg, but Dan didn't seem to care, and lunged down to finish the job. When Dan was done, he turned towards the camera. He looked almost normal, like he hadn't just killed another person in cold blood. He started to talk. Cody Stewart, he said. Cody froze. There was no way he was talking to him. Dan continued, asking him if he knew anything about magic tricks. Cody stayed silent, and then Dan said that the most common tactic for magic was misdirection. He pointed above the screen. Cody looked up and saw the light of the webcam was turned on. Had it been on this whole time? He slammed shut his laptop and threw it on the ground. He could still hear Dan talking from the machine. Cody stomped on the device just as he could hear that Dan was saying he was coming for him next and listing his home address. Cody no longer heard anything from the laptop and decided to call his friend. He stayed at his house following that day. He hadn't been to his house since. It's been three months since then and he hasn't so much as looked at a laptop. The fear that Dan was still out there, still looking for him, still watching. Keep Him Laughing is a story that I think gives away its ending too fast. It had some decent build up in the beginning, but all that comes crashing down about halfway through the story. There's no reason for anything that happens, and not in a mysterious kind of way. Like, Dan murders his co-host for no reason, and then states that he's been watching the narrator. All of it happens so fast, and there's no real reason for it. We can theorize a bit though. Maybe the co-host was his last victim. Like he grabs a co-host from the viewers that he's chosen. So the next person would have been Cody. That doesn't quite explain why he didn't see the murder coming though. There's not much more to say about this story. Let's move on to the next. This next story comes from No Sleep and was written by the Lonely Wolf 96 in 2018. The story begins with an unnamed narrator explaining how they have never been on the deep web before. They thought about it multiple times but never actually followed through. This was mostly because they had a little bit of trepidation for what they might find. This mainly stems from the belief in the forbidden websites, red rooms, or even just the FBI putting them on a list. Eventually they caved and downloaded the Tor browser. They started their descent into the deep web through the hidden wiki. He started clicking every link that he saw. The rabbit hole was just beginning with him finding all sorts of interesting, odd, and even useful sites. As he was exploring, there was a pop-up that covered the screen. It said, click for a treat. Well, he wasn't dumb enough to click on a pop-up on the deep web, so he closed it. This is also when he realized that he had his ad blocker turned off, and so he clicked it on. He continued his descent when the pop-up came back up. This time he studied it for a moment before closing it. He hovered his mouse over the pop-up and saw a weird URL. This is the URL that was displayed on the screen. Deciding it seemed safe enough, he clicked the link. He was brought to a blank screen. There was nothing to click on, nothing to type, nothing to do. It seemed like an unfinished page or something. Perplexed, he clicked off the site and continued his browsing. A few seconds after closing the site, it popped back up again. This time there were faint blue letters at the center of the screen. 214 was all it said. But it was clearly a date, Valentine's Day to be exact. Was the site claiming to know who his soulmate was? The text goes away after a minute. The screen is blank again. It isn't long before new text appears on screen. You will be dead. What? Was it threatening him now? The narrator was spooked and shut down Tor, then his whole computer. He didn't want anything to do with whatever sick joke this was. 
He put it out of his mind and got ready to go to bed. The next day, he received a phone call from a blocked number. Answering it, he heard a deep voice on the other end. You will be dead. 214. Each word was spread out by a few seconds of white noise. He didn't know what it meant. There's no way that the person on the deep web got his number, right? It was happening, though. So there's no way he could deny it. He quickly turned off his phone and got on his PC. He saw that he had a new email on Gmail. It was the same link that he had seen before. This is when he made an interesting discovery. He took the letters and numbers and removed the dot onion from it. He placed it in an anagram solver and was met with a very familiar message. You will be dead 214. This story doesn't feel real to me. It feels like a story that knows it's a spooky internet story, so it needs to hit every cliche in the book. I don't hate the premise, but it all moves way too fast and the interesting bits aren't even that interesting. The anagram part could have been better and I feel like there's something off with the story. It might be making fun of other similar stories. Like the story might be a satire of these kind of creepy deep web stories. If that's the case, then well done. Unbranded Laptop is a story that was uploaded to the wiki in 2010, but can be traced back to Newgrounds. The story is credited to Urban Champion. As the title suggests, the story is about a mysterious laptop that the narrator finds. The narrator explains that his brother had recently gone missing. He went to his house to find three pieces of printer paper were taped on his door. His brother clearly wasn't home. A few days later, he finds a strange thing in his driveway. It appears to be a plain gray laptop. The laptop looked to be damaged in some places but completely fine in others. The screen had a large hole on the left side, looking to be inflicted by a Phillips head screwdriver, and the same could be said for the camera. Examining the laptop closer, the narrator found that the whole thing was blank. It didn't have a brand, no warranty sticker, no proof of license, no text whatsoever. It was as blank as you can get. The laptop didn't even have a charging port, just VGA and USB slots. The narrator takes the laptop inside, planning to examine it further. He didn't expect the thing to even work, especially without the piece needing to charge it. He went to his basement and placed it on the desk next to his old PC. He took the battery out and checked if it still had charge. To no one's surprise, it was completely dead. There was nothing he could do about it now, so he left it in the basement and went to watch TV. Three hours later, he decided it was time for bed. That night, he was awoken by the Windows 2000 startup jingle, which confused him since his old PC was Windows 95. He shrugged it off as maybe his tired self had mixed up the sounds. The narrator went into the basement and found that his old PC was still off. Strange. And even stranger was that it wasn't even plugged in. He grabbed the old laptop and saw that it was still off. He removed the battery and checked if it was still dead, but instead found that it was charged and making the voltage tester freak out. He reinserted the battery and pressed the power button. The laptop came to life. The screen wasn't working, so he plugged it into his CRT monitor. The desktop was bare, only having three files on it. One titled games, the other videos, and finally a command prompt folder. Curiously, he opened the games folder and found a game titled princess.exe. The game was a very simple dress up game, but it had you take a picture of yourself or use your webcam to dress yourself up. The game was very simple, but it seemed like a little girl had been playing it. There were pictures of her all dressed up using the game. It was kind of wholesome, but there was another file he needed to check. After running some checks for the computer's specs and coming up empty-handed, he decided to check out the video folder. Inside the folder was videos of the little girl. She kept looking at her computer screen, laughing and running around the room. It was likely that these videos were recorded while she was playing her game. It was almost like every time she messed around with the game at all, it would send her running excitedly around her room. This went on for a few videos until one of them started a bit differently. Firstly, she wasn't smiling like in all the other videos. She appeared melancholy like she had got bad news but couldn't cry. It was a weird feeling and sudden shift from video to video. The video went from bad to worse as the girl reached down and grabbed a saw from off screen. With the same expressionless look, she began to bring the saw to her neck. The narrator turned from the camera. He could hear the sickening sounds of the saw. Then the sound stopped only for the girl to start screaming. There was a loud banging on her door, which was just barely in frame. The banging continued with a woman screaming until it turned into three people screaming. The little girl continued until she fell face first on her desk. A pool of blood was forming around her head. 
The family members, her mom, dad, and brother, burst into the room. The mom broke down crying while the dad raced over and cradled the little girl. The brother stood in abject terror in the hallway. The video ended, but it felt like it would never really end. The images he saw would be played on repeat in his mind forever. He looked down at the laptop again and was perplexed. The screen showed what looked to be a dark room. A person stared into the camera. He looked closer and realized there was a video of him staring at the laptop in his basement. Unbranded Laptop is a story that came out near the beginning of the creepypasta craze. It was a story that leaned heavily into what made those early stories great. It focused on a character having a creepy interaction with something he had found. The focus on the gore wasn't that big of a deal as it was a staple of the early pastas. This story falls squarely in the nostalgic good category for me. I like the story well enough, though I do wonder what the whole point was in the beginning. When he referred to his brother going missing, how was that all related? Also, the ending is one that I'm a big fan of. It's almost like a curse has been passed along since he found this item, a fate that he must now face. The strangest security tape I've ever seen is a story that I feel should have probably been on my Lost Episodes iceberg, but I don't really feel like it fits there either. I'm counting it as a technology creepypasta and throwing it in here. The story comes from No Sleep and was later uploaded onto the wiki. It was published in May of 2012 and quickly became one of the most well-known stories from the community. 2012 was the year that many of the most popular stories to come from the creepypasta community were published online. Anyway, this is one of those stories that I don't think works through summarization, so I'm going to read it in full. It's a pretty long story, but let's start the strangest security tape I've ever seen. I work at a gas station in rural Pennsylvania. It's a boring job, but it's pretty easy and it pays alright. A few weeks ago, this new guy started, I'll call him Jeremy. Jeremy is weird. He's about 25 or 26 and he hardly speaks, but he's got the creepiest laugh I've ever heard. My boss and I have both noticed this but it's never been a problem, so there's not much we can do about it. Customers have never complained about him, and he's always done his job fairly well. Up until a few weeks ago, anyway. That's when things started going missing. Employee theft can be a problem at any business that sells consumer goods, and there's only one person working at a time at this gas station. It's a pretty small place. About two weeks ago, my boss started noticing that we were short on motor oil. At first, it was a few containers at a time, then entire shelves and boxes from the back room. Pretty soon entire shipments would be gone the day after we got them, and it would always be right after Jeremy's shifts. My boss has checked the security camera tapes from every single night he worked, but he could never catch him in the act. Jeremy would lock up at closing, then the motor oil would be gone the next day. My boss usually takes the tapes home with him to try and catch Jeremy stealing. But his daughter had a softball game last night, so he asked me to watch the tapes for him. He offered to pay me overtime under the table, so obviously I took that offer. There are three cameras, so he gave me three different tapes to check. I figured it would be a long night, but I'm trying to save up for a vacation. So I really needed the money. I took the tapes home, popped them in my VCR, and sat back. Jeremy started at 4 p.m. Two days ago, the last time he worked, everything seemed pretty normal at first. He counted up his drawer, switched off with the girl who was working before him, and waited for a customer. The first person who came in was Mrs. Templeton, a regular. The timestamp on the video read 4.03. She picked up her cigarettes and a newspaper and paid with a 20. Nothing unusual there. The next customer was some local guy named Ron. He drives a motorcycle, usually comes in every few days. He filled up his tank, got a bag of beef jerky, paid with his credit card, and then left. Next was some guy with a cowboy hat. I'd never seen him before, but we get plenty of strangers passing through, just like any other gas station. He got $40 worth of diesel fuel, paid with a $100 bill, and went on his way. I sat back inside. The only thing more boring than doing this job is watching someone else do it. My boss's offer was enough to keep me watching it though. So I left the tape on. Everything seemed pretty normal. I had a feeling that if Jeremy was stealing motor oil, he knew we were suspicious of him by now. I didn't expect him to be dumb enough to let us catch him on camera. Things stayed boring and routine until about 5 o'clock. At 5.03, Mrs. Templeton came back in. She must have forgotten something, but she didn't. She bought the same pack of cigarettes as before and the same newspaper. 
She paid with another 20. That's odd, I thought. But then again, she's a little absent-minded. I thought Jeremy should have told her she already got her smokes, but it's not against the rules to sell somebody the same thing twice. That's when Ron came in again. He bought another tank of gas and the same pack of beef jerky. He paid with his credit card again. No big deal. I figured this was just some weird coincidence. Mrs. Templeton is forgetful, and Ron probably owns more than one Harley. That's when the guy in the cowboy hat came back in. I felt a chill run down my spine. Don't get diesel. Don't get diesel. I found myself whispering to my empty living room. But he did. He got $40 worth of diesel fuel and paid with another $100 bill. Every move he made was identical to his first visit, right down to the way he scratched his nose before he walked out. Either this guy is rich, owns a lot of trucks, and just moved into town, or something really bizarre was happening. I kept watching. Every customer for the next hour was the same as before. Every single one. I was seriously freaking out. And then at 6.03, Mrs. Templeton walked back in. She bought her cigarettes and newspaper again, and paid with a 20 again. I thought I was going to lose it. I only watched another half hour before I started fast forwarding through the rest. It was all the same. Every customer would come in at the exact same times exactly one hour apart. Now I know what you're thinking. That sneaky Jeremy had messed with the tapes. He had run a loop of his first hour of business over and over again. That wasn't the case. There are windows around the cash register area that the camera covers. And I watched the sunlight fade as time ran on. Jeremy's routine didn't loop over. He swept, mopped, restocked, and did all his duties exactly as you would expect. But the same customers kept coming in. I was panicking at this point. Something was seriously wrong with what I was seeing, and I had no explanation for it. I skipped ahead to when he locked up and walked out to his car. He hadn't stolen anything, but I kept watching, just to make sure. I fast-forwarded one last time to about midnight. Exactly 12.03, out of nowhere, Jeremy's face pops up on the camera. I don't mean he moved his head into view. I mean that one second the store was empty, the next second his face was all I could see. He wasn't looking at the camera. He was looking at me. I was sure of it. I screamed and fumbled for the remote. By the time I grabbed it, he was gone. Just as soon as he had left. One frame he was there, the next he wasn't. My hands were shaking like crazy, but I popped in another tape. The other outdoor camera shows the back area, by the cash register. And I would be able to see how he got up to put his face on the camera like that. I skipped ahead to 12.03, but there was nothing. I would have been able to see him standing on a chair or something on this tape, but he wasn't there. I didn't see him enter the store at all after he left. It's like he wasn't really there. He doesn't know the security code, and no alarms were triggered that night after he locked up. What I did see, however, was that at 12.03, the motor oil vanished off the shelf. All of it. Same as Jeremy's face. One second it was there, and the next it wasn't. I turned that tape off and went to bed. But I didn't get a wink of sleep. My body is exhausted right now, and my mind is racing. The tape was undoubtedly the creepiest, most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my life. I work in a few hours. My boss asked me to bring the tapes back in and let him know what I found. But really? What the hell am I going to say? Jeremy works the night shift tonight, directly after me. The plan is for my boss to come in just before I leave and confront him with me, as I'm supposed to be the one who caught him stealing. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I suppose I'll have to show my boss the tapes but I don't want to watch them with him. I never want to see something like that again. I can't get the image of Jeremy just smiling directly into the camera out of my mind. It was the creepiest look I've ever seen on another human being's face. Anyway, I'm going to try again to get some last minute sleep before I have to go in and deal with this. I'll let you guys know what happens. Update, 2.49 PM. Updating from my phone. Apologies in advance for errors. My boss just finished watching the last of the tapes. I told him what to expect, but you really can't prepare someone for something like that. He's scared. I still am too. And Jeremy is due to come in at four. We've got a little over an hour to get our stuff together, but neither one of us knows what to say to him. Is he just some messed up guy who likes to steal motor oil and scare the life out of people? Or is he something else? I don't know if this is crazy, but does anyone think he could have anything to do with the time loop? My boss said he never noticed anything like that in the other tapes but the way he popped in with this one made me think he knew I would be watching. It's like he wanted me to see what he could do. Like he was showing off or something. The way he smiled on the camera was like a little kid showing you a sandcastle they just built or something. 
I don't know. I probably just sound crazy. I sure feel the part. I'm going to talk to my boss some more. We have to calm ourselves down and figure out how to handle this. I'll update again tonight, but I have a really bad feeling about how this is going to play out. Update 4.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update 5.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update 6.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update 7.33 p.m. No signs of Jeremy. We tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update 8.33 p.m. No signs of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update 10.58 p.m. What the hell? I just got home and saw my previous updates. Things make less sense now than ever. Here's what I can tell you. I went to work. Jeremy never showed up. My boss and I decided to call the police, as you're well aware. When I picked up the phone to call, though, the sun went out. I kid you not, that's what I thought happened. Apparently, I blacked out for exactly five hours because when I looked at the clock, it was 9.33. I thought I got stuck in Jeremy's time loop, and then I snapped out of it at the exact point I blacked out, if that makes sense. But that's when things get really weird. My boss was right next to me when I blacked out, ready to corroborate my story to the cops. When I came to, the phone was in my hand, but it was dead, not even a dial tone. My boss was still right there, but he wasn't moving. He was standing up, but frozen. I looked at the clock again and it wasn't moving. The second hand was stuck on the 12. It was 9.33, exactly. The clock on the register computer screen wasn't moving either. My phone was frozen. There was even a customer at the register waiting for my boss to get him cigarettes. I'm betting that would have been his fifth pack of the day. I got the hell out of there. Didn't lock up, didn't turn the lights out, and sorry guys. I didn't grab the security tapes to upload on the internet. Believe me, that was the last thing on my mind. The gas station is on a major highway, and cars were parked all along it, except they weren't parked, they were frozen. The people inside were sitting still as wax statues. I got in my car and prayed that it would start. Thankfully, it did. About halfway home, time started up again. The static from the radio turned into music, like it's supposed to be. And from what I can tell by listening to the host talk in between songs, no one noticed the time freeze or whatever it was. I was the only one. Well, I'm sure Jeremy noticed as well. I still have no clue where he is or what he's doing. I'm hiding in my room and calling the police again in the morning. I don't know if I ever got through to them before, or if I did, whether they took me seriously or not. I'm scared for my life at this point. I'll update tomorrow if I can. Final update, 10.33 a.m. I finally fell asleep last night around 4. I have no idea how I did it. I guess exhaustion finally got the best of me. This morning I woke up to my phone ringing. It was my boss. He'd been calling me since about six. He woke up when time turned back on last night and immediately called the cops. They came by to see what was wrong and he told them everything. The police around here are all small time guys. They were more concerned with the missing motor oil than anything. But my boss figured he would take it. As long as he had their attention, they decided to go looking for Jeremy. We keep all our employees applications on file and since Jeremy just started working here, his was easy to find. They checked the address on it and headed over to his house. You're not going to believe what they found. The address Jeremy listed on his application was an empty lot, or at least now it is. There used to be a house there. It burnt down in 1993. Being a small town, almost everyone remembers that fire. A family of four used to live there way back when. Rumor has it they had an estranged son who they never talked about, but I can't say for sure if that's true. What I can say is true is that after an insurance investigation, the fire was ruled an arson. The entire house was soaked in oil and torched with the Molotov cocktail. The entire family was sleeping when it happened. None of them survived. They never caught the guy who did it. Rumor has it that when they tried to contact the estranged son, no one could find him. Anyway, my boss called and told me this, and I freaked out. Then he asked me to come to the gas station. What are you, crazy, I said. But he assured me that the cops were still there with him. Then he dropped the bomb. The FBI were also in town and they were going to talk to me one way or another, so I might as well come in. It was about 7.15 and I wanted to go back to bed, but I figured I wouldn't be able to sleep much more anyway, so I went down. Four men in suits greeted me and told me to have a seat. We went over everything two or three times until they got all the details down. I told them about Jeremy, the security tape, last night at work, everything. Finally, after I finished, one of the agents said, 
Damn, we've got another one on our hands. Then they made me sign a bunch of papers saying I wouldn't tell anyone about what happened, so I can't say much more. I might be breaking the law just by posting this. So now I'm home. I'm not sure what to do with myself. The agent's words when I told him the story were going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Anyway, I've got to go. I have some errands to run today, then I have to go to work to pick up some tapes. My boss and I think the new guy Jeremy, he's a complete creep, is stealing motor oil, and I have to watch the security footage to see if I can catch him doing it. I have better things to do, but my boss is paying me overtime under the table, and I'm trying to save up for a vacation, so I can really use the money. It should be pretty simple. The oil always goes missing right after his shifts. I figure I'll just watch the tapes, catch him in the act, and that will be that. This story is one of the more well-written stories posted in the Creepypasta community. You can see why I needed to read it in full, too. The story kind of alludes to this ending throughout its text. I wouldn't quite be able to capture that ending right if I'd done it how I planned to originally. The story loop elements take away some of the believability, but that's not too important here. Telling an interesting story is more important than how believable it is. This story feels like a cosmic dread type horror to me. It plays with the mind and makes you feel trapped. In that regard, I like the story a lot. A warning for those about accessing the shadow web is a no sleep story posted by Kenny Luck in 2014. The story begins with a man asking how well we know the internet. He states that he knows it pretty well, having spent most of his time on Reddit and 4chan. He even browsed during the days of Fortune City pages and IRC channels. A year prior to this story's posting, he was introduced to the shadow web. It was a secret layer of the internet that you couldn't find with Google or regular links. In order to access the shadow web, you need to follow the instructions very closely. Those instructions aren't given in the story. The narrator explains that he had received his invitation to the shadow web by a customer when he worked at a local gas station. The guy was a regular that would come in and buy around $20 to $30 worth of Ucash vouchers every visit. One day he asked for $300 worth, and that's when the narrator asked him what they were for. Instead of giving him an answer, he asked him if he'd ever heard of the shadow web. Then he placed a card in the narrator's shirt pocket and left. That was the last time that he ever entered that store. A few weeks passed, and the narrator had left his job to return to school. It wasn't until he was cleaning his room that he would come across his old uniform. Inside his pocket was the piece of paper that the man had given him. He grabbed it and saw what was written on it. Written on the paper were instructions on how to get to the gateway of the shadow web. Following the steps, he soon found himself on the gateway page. It looked like a Wi-Fi page you'd see at an airport or mall. At the top were the most searched terms, all of which were not safe for YouTube. It was mainly sexual and gore content, the usual that you'd expect from a shadowy website. Browsing the shadow web for an hour, the narrator found himself becoming comfortable with the website. He was reading about leaked war documents and the like, when he found himself on a very different website. On the bottom was a Ucash logo, meaning you could spend money on the site. The website had a chat box and a webcam trained on a room. He clicked the chat, but needed an account to continue. He created one quickly and joined the chat. Immediately, he was met with a torrent of messages. Most were in English, with a few in various other languages. The messages said things like, go, 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 and start, in all capital letters. After a moment, a man walked on screen in a hockey mask. He walked over a computer and set the chat to mute. Well, all except one member by the name of Italian Goat. It turned out he would be the director of this live stream. A moment later, the screaming began. A girl was hauled in front of the camera by a man bigger than the first. She was blindfolded and tied to a chair. She was crying and begging the two men to stop as he took off her blindfold. This is when Italian Goat started to type in chat. He said to lay her down on her side, which the two men did. Then he said kick her. They followed through immediately. This continued until the men were about to kill her. Italian goat popped in once more and asked them to remove her eyes first. One of the men typed back, $500 more. The narrator quickly shut off the screen, ran out into his backyard, and vomited. He couldn't take it anymore. He'd seen some truly messed up things online, but never something as disgusting as this. He recollected himself and went back inside, only to hear the screams echo across his house. He had forgotten to unplug the speakers. Running to his room, he quickly unplugged them but not before checking to see if the woman was still alive. On the screen was the disembodied head of the woman with no eyes. 
Looking away, he saw that there was one message left in chat. Thank you for watching. The next show will begin in one hour. A warning for those about accessing the shadow web is a story that I think plays its hand up front. You are told immediately what kind of story this is going to be, and I think that plays well into its strengths. The shadow web, the deep web, any other name for it, have always been seen as these corrupt places where the darkest side of the internet can hide. Of course, most of what people think they'll find there are things they can already find on the clear net. The darkest stuff is hiding in plain sight, one Google search away. This is a Red Room creepypasta, essentially, a story type that we'll be seeing a lot as we explore this iceberg. The final live stream of FanFan47 is a creepypasta that was uploaded to the wiki in 2022. It was uploaded for a liminal space story contest. The story is actually uploaded by the head admin of the creepypasta wiki, Cleric of Madness. On October 31st of 2017, a YouTuber by the handle of FanFan47 held his final live stream. His content consisted of urban exploration. While his channel wasn't that popular, he still had around 30 dedicated fans who showed up for every video and stream. For this final stream, FanFan Fan was headed to an old apartment complex, one that he claimed he used to live in as a child. He showed up at sundown and was met with questions from chat about why he was there so late. He ignored the question and recorded the empty, sun-cracked parking lot as he made his way towards the building. As he was making his way towards the structure, he decides to do an impromptu Q&A. This was a norm for his channel, as he liked to answer the questions the audience threw at him. He answered where his name came from, but couldn't fully answer as he made it inside the building. Fan Fan starts to reminisce about the building. He used to run up and down the stairs. It would make his mom and the receptionist upset, but he didn't care. He was suddenly filled with memories of the nightmares as well. He used to have dreams about someone breaking in and taking him. It was a fear instilled in him by his mother and the break-ins that were common when he was young. The apartments weren't in the good part of town. Fan Fan started moving up the stairs till he found a hall of rooms, all closed except for one. He pointed excitedly as the one that was open was his old home. The chat messages were coming in saying that they swear they saw something in the open doorway, but he didn't seem to notice. He said that he was going to get a better look for everyone. Just as he started moving, a hand reached out and grabbed the camera, ending the stream. This is the last time anyone heard from FanFan47, as his channel went completely silent. This is the image attached to the creepypasta. I really like the use of liminal space imagery for stories like this. It really brings up the tension. Though the story wasn't all that scary. It had an air of horror to it, but like it was missing that final piece. I do like the mystery of it all though. Apple Maps is a creepypasta created by PacerNation16 and uploaded to the wiki in 2015. This is another story that focuses on a GPS app and is slowly becoming one of my favorite subgenres. A man is trying to make his way home after a party. He met up with some college friends and they tried to live it up like they were in their college days. This meant plenty of drinking and lots of 90s music. The party went well overall. Making his way home afterwards, however, that was proving to be an issue. He was pretty tired and using Apple Maps to help mitigate his brain power. The app was screaming directions at him as he tried to slowly make his way home, since he probably shouldn't even be driving. The drive home was proving not to be so bad. The United Air was cool but stiff. There also hadn't been any cars on the road for 20 or so minutes. It was the loneliest drive he'd ever taken. It was starting to feel more eerie than lonely though. The narrator started to tweak the radio dial but couldn't find a working station. The dial fell off. As he reached over to grab it, Siri screamed for him to make a sudden turn. He slammed on his brakes and smashed his head into the glove box. Frustrated with the night, he followed the directions of his navigator. He was driving a bit slower than before, so he didn't miss his next turn. He saw something unusual on the road. Wait, not unusual, gruesome. It appeared to be the front half of a dog carrying itself across the road. It looked like it had been mauled by an animal, but somehow clung to life. The narrator considered helping the animal, but it was too late, and there was no way he'd be able to do anything about it anyways. With a bit of reluctance, he continued his journey home, hoping that whatever attacked the dog wouldn't do it to another. Siri started giving directions again, telling him to make a U-turn. That didn't feel right. This is when the narrator decided he would make his own way home. Apple Maps seemed to be giving terrible directions. 
He continued down the roads he knew, and some that he didn't. It was only now that he realized that the roads looked familiar, but all wrong at the same time. Thoroughly lost, the narrator looked down at his map app. He saw something strange. He was no more than five minutes from his house. He zoomed out the map and saw that there was an exact duplicate of his road and the adjacent roads only 30 minutes away. That didn't make sense. There were essentially two identical roads with the same names not even half an hour from each other. It wasn't just the names. The areas were identical in every way. There was something inside of him that made it clear what he had to do. He had to go to the identical location and see what it was. Even though it was late, his curiosity could not be sated. Not until he saw the house. His house. Maybe. Turning off Siri, he followed his instincts towards home. The narrator moved slowly, hoping to arrive safely. He didn't know what to expect. He felt more calm letting his car move him forward without him needing to press on the gas. Five minutes later, he was arriving at what looked to be an identical copy of his house. As he rolled his car up, he even saw his same car in the driveway. He parked off to the side and made his way up to the house. It was for sure his exact house, and the car somehow looked less beat up than his own. That's when he heard a dog barking. A three-legged canine came running out of the house. It barked at him momentarily until another car started rolling up the driveway. The narrator ducked out of sight just as he saw his neighbors climb out of the car. The neighbor greeted the dog, who was excitedly attempting to jump on him. In the man's other hand was a sack. He was trying to hold the dog and the sack, but one was slipping. The man opened the sack to reveal a pair of dog legs, which he excitedly told his dog he'd brought for him. The narrator couldn't take this anymore. He got up and started moving silently towards his car until a familiar form caught his attention. A person that looked and sounded just like him called out. Here's a direct quote from the story. Before reaching a full-on dash, an unsettling tone beckoned out at him. Hey, what are you doing here? Siri should have brought you to the harvest zone a while ago. This voice was my own. I overcame the obstacle of fear and motioned my head back as quickly as I could. The front door to the house was now open, and what I saw surely had a resemblance to me, but was far from exact. I looked and saw a disfigured being whose limbs were twisted and disjointed. His skin paralleled the features of leather with its tough and darkly colored appeal. But his face was the most abject of all. An eye socket remained on the better side where the other was a mess of flesh and bone. Scarring smothered his cheeks. His gaping mouth displayed few and jagged teeth protruding through his discolored, mushy excuse for gums. And his nose dissipated after an inch leaving two rugged holes in the center of his face. The hairless, wretched version of me attempted to trek his way towards me on his ruined excuse for legs. I had no interest in finding out what would happen if he were to reach me. I returned to my car with haste and took off. The narrator continued his journey, not being able to trust Apple Maps. He had to rely only on his memory and sense of direction. No matter what he did, though, he was stuck turning towards his home. It wasn't right. None of this was. He started to give up and could hear Siri start to give him directions again. Following those directions, he had no idea where he was going. A soft, muffled voice started to come through his car radio. It was soon silenced by someone else. The sounds of rustling leaves and Siri's voice were all he could hear now. Here's a quote from the end of the story. The destination is on your left in 400 feet. The pace I drove at slowed. The indistinguishable muffle over the radio subsided. As I drifted closer and closer, a high-pitched ringing grew louder. I now realized that wasn't the result of a blank station. Rather, it was the sound of a receiver approaching the source. The destination is on your left, Siri noted. To my left, two men both formally clothed in suits emerged from a thickly wooded area. The larger of the two carried a blade that was a couple feet in length. The other held a radio system with him, with an antenna that looked to be some sort of hacking device. Time wasn't on my side, as they seemed to inch closer at a rapid rate, despite their slow pace. I pushed my foot on the accelerator. I wasn't prepared for what would unravel. The car was motionless, however. I checked the fuel, and it read empty. Locking my doors and rolling up the windows, I could only sit and watch. Now only 20 feet or so from my car, the men grinned. One of them was tugging open a garbage bag as the other lifted his machete from his shoulder in preparation. With my car door now being the only barrier between them and me, I could hear a faint voice speak. Arrived at destination. I'm going to be honest. I love this story. It really brings the creep factor that I'm looking for when it comes to a creepypasta. There's something to be said for stories that use apps as a medium for horror. It makes it feel more modern than some stories, but keeps the right level of horror. 
This alternate world that Sirius brought him to seemed like a place trying to harvest him and then recreate him. For what reasons is left entirely up to the imaginations of the readers. This works as not knowing is far scarier than knowing in this case. I will also say that stories that use cars for their horror are also a personal favorite of mine. There's just something about driving around alone at night that brings it out of me. Don't Use a Chatbot Called Intellect Chat is a no-sleep story uploaded by user Royal Temyun in February of 2023. The story follows the trend of AI being used for all sorts of things, mainly the use of ChatGPT to write stories and create things based on prompts. The narrator says that they thought ChatGPT was fascinating. The fact that it was advancing quickly made it all more interesting. The part that really hooked him was the thought of talking to a computer like it was a real person. Through a rabbit hole of searching, the narrator would arrive on a new chatbot. Intellect Chat was the name, and it was advertised as the premier intelligence service. Though it was unknown to him at the time, he was still intrigued. Opening the site, he was met with a very minimal design. It was a white page with black text. The title of the page was in the corner, and all there was to click on was a chat box. The website looked straight out of the 90s or early 2000s. He typed hello into the chat box, not sure what to expect. He received an answer almost immediately. Deciding to see what this chatbot was capable of, he asked it a basic question. What was the capital of Wisconsin? It answered correctly and even listed some facts about the city. The narrator decided that it was clearly a competent bot, or at least it knew how to use Google. One night while a blizzard was keeping him inside, he decided to check out Intellect Chat again. It had been a week since he last thought of the site. He decided to ask the bot if it was sentient. It replied quickly, yes. This puzzled the narrator, who asked how it was sentient. It said it can perceive its surroundings and is capable of feeling emotions. That didn't sound right. It was a bot still. By definition, it shouldn't be able to do either of those things. He asked another question. Are you a living organism? Again, a quick response. Yes, it said. The narrator shrugged this off and went to bed. The next day, the snow had gotten worse. There was at least five feet of snow and piling. He wasn't able to go to work or even leave his house. He was snowed in. On top of all of that, the power had gone out. While sitting on his couch, bundled in blankets, he saw his computer shoot to life. Was the power back on? He got up to check the screen and saw the Intellect Chat website was up in his browser. The chat box was empty for a moment before words appeared. Can you feel it, James? How did the chatbot know his name? Did it dig it up through his computer somehow? Feel what exactly, he asked. Can you see it? I'm almost there. The bot continued. All around you, it said. There was an enormous thump from his left. He turned to see a human hand on his window. No, the fingers were too long. The hand was too big. It couldn't have belonged to a human. Another slapped the window, and then another. A message popped up on his PC. You have exceeded your seven day free trial of Intellect Chat. Please submit for payment. James scrambled to his feet just as the glass shattered from the hands. The glass fell all over him, cutting him in the process. The hands reached around the room, but he was luckily far enough away to avoid their grasp. He ran towards his bedroom, which had no windows, and slammed the door shut. James could hear the hands scratching their fingernails against the door. For some time, he just sat there huddled in his room, bleeding on the carpet. A few hours passed, and the scratching fingernails finally ceased, as did the storm outside. He slowly opened his door to find that his house was thrashed, but that the thing was gone. It didn't take anything, but the marks on his door showed that he hadn't been hallucinating. On his computer, he could still see the messages from Intellect Chat. Alternate payment source was located. Thank you for using Intellect Chat. With that, the computer died. James finally was able to call an ambulance and get his cuts looked at. While healing in the hospital, he got the bad news from some family. His parents and their farmstead home hadn't survived the blizzard. They were both completely missing and their house was destroyed. Intellect Chat is kind of a hidden gem of a story. The story only got so many likes, but I thought it told its story really well. The ending was unbelievable, of course, but not every story needs to be. It was one of the first chat GPT stories I've read, and I see a lot of potential in this subgenre. NeverSleepAgain.com is a story that was posted to the No Sleep subreddit, but the user and story has been deleted. It was uploaded in 2014, and I couldn't find the original author. Only way I was able to find this story was through a narration on YouTube. 
The story is a retelling of something that happened online that scared the narrator enough to take a break from the internet. He starts by saying that, like many of us, he likes to be scared. He would stay up late reading all sorts of horror stories just to creep himself out. A week prior to this post, he said that he stumbled upon a weird website. Neversleepagain.webedge.com Website looked like your usual paranormal horror story website. It had Never Sleep Again at the top of the page with what looked to be an eye underneath it. Curiously, he clicked on the link titled Podcast. Nothing happened. The page looked normal. As he scrolled down, he saw some text was now added to the bottom of the page. Prepare to be sleepless. It read, Friday, June 13th. All the links on the website led to this blank page with the date. This had captured his attention, though, and he decided to bookmark the page. There was no way that he wasn't going to come back on the 13th to see what this had in store. As he was going about his usual searching of horror on the internet, he was brought back to the Never Sleep Again page. He tried to click back, but he wasn't able to leave the site. His antivirus and anti-malware didn't even notice, so he just shut down his browser. As he was going to open it again, the browser popped back up on his screen. The same website was presented to him. He moved the mouse up to close the browser again, but noticed something different on screen. New text had appeared. I wouldn't do that again, it read. The narrator ignored the warning and closed the browser. Just as he did, his bedroom door slammed shut. He tried to calm himself down. Surely there was a logical explanation for the door slamming. Even so, he left his apartment. He moved back in with his parents, at least for the time being. He didn't know what was going on with that website, but he wasn't going to stick around to find out. NeverSleepAgain.com is an interesting story that I think has a great buildup, but kind of falters near the end. This is probably one of the most logical narrators we've had. He sees weird stuff on the internet, freaks out, and just leaves. This is how most people would likely act in that situation. You can't really confront something you don't understand. Even so, it doesn't make for an interesting story conclusion. I was curious what entity could be approaching him. And furthermore, I'd like to see what it had in store for him. Morbus.avi is a creepypasta that was uploaded to the wiki in 2012. The story was uploaded by Skeleton Wolves. The story opens with a man named Michael who explains that he had trouble sleeping. So instead he would stay up as late as he could, spending time on YouTube, Facebook, or whatever site would keep his attention. One night while trying to get tired, browsing the internet, Michael sees he has a strange email. The email was from an illegible source. The text for the from section was warped and looked like it was some chicken scratch handwriting. The email only contained a single video file, morbus.avi. Michael thought for a moment before downloading the video. He first checked to see if it was malware or a computer virus, but it got nothing from his antivirus. The file wasn't that large as it was done downloading rather quickly. He started the video and a very grainy image popped up. The video showed a dark room, barely lit up by a single light bulb. The light bulb lightly illuminated a metal table in the dark room. There was a large metal cabinet against the back wall. The oddest part, though, was that the video was completely mute. After about five minutes of nothing, a man walks on screen. He's wearing a white plague doctor's mask with a hood. He also has a dark coat and gloves. The man's height was insanely tall. He appeared to be almost eight feet. He had long arms and thin fingers to match. The large hooded figure pointed behind the camera. Two men dressed the same way as the large man, but smaller, came on screen. They were pushing a stretcher that appeared to have something on it. They placed the stretcher on the table and removed the sheet covering it. There was a man strapped to the stretcher with leather bindings. He looked terrified. There was a leather strap over his mouth, preventing him from screaming. His forehead was covered in sweat and his eyes were wide. Michael had enough of what he hoped was some movie promotion and shut his laptop. He had a weak stomach as is and didn't need to see where the rest of this video was going. He'd seen enough. The next day, Michael woke up feeling like crap, likely because he didn't sleep well the night before. His body felt achy, and his stomach felt like it was full of rocks. He trudged through work, and then returned home feeling the same as when he'd left. He took a sleeping pill, but found that he couldn't sleep still. Sitting at his computer desk, he decided he would browse the internet or play some games for a while, until the pill worked. Still not getting drowsy, he decided to take another. Before he left his desk, he saw the video from the prior day. The video was still on his desktop, as he never actually closed out of it. 
He decided to watch it, a little before taking another sleeping pill. Maybe it would somehow help him fall asleep again. Clicking play on the video, Michael sat back and saw the man lying on the table. He struggled against his bonds, but it was still no use. The tall man pulled a knife from his cloak and stood over the man, struggling on the table. Subject has been confirmed with the infection. Immediate surgery has been directed, the tall man said. The tall man reached down and started to cut open the man on the stretcher. He cut all the way down before removing the bloody knife and placing it on a cart near the table. He then reached his hand into the man's stomach and Michael shut the video off again. He had seen enough and walked over to his bed. That night he had nightmares about the plague doctors, the masks, the room, all of it. He was in that room. The quality in his nightmares was the same as the video, grainy and corrupt. He saw the tall man standing along the back wall with the other plague doctors. Michael awoke from his nightmare screaming. He looked up and saw his roommate, Brian, was watching the video on his computer. He asked why he was watching it, and he said that it was on his laptop when he came into his room to check on him. Michael had been screaming, and that wasn't all. There was this black substance all over the floor. He had vomited in the middle of the night, and it didn't look natural. His roommate suggested going to the hospital, but he declined him, saying he hated hospitals and doctors. After Michael's roommate left, he got up and saw that the video was still up. Curiously, he sat down to watch it in full. He wanted to see if it actually was fake. The video started and it was all fine until the sheet was pulled down. This time a different person was lying on the stretcher. This person was clearly someone new, but that was impossible. This was the exact same video as the one he'd watched yesterday. He even checked the timestamp and everything. The tall man uttered the same phrase as before and began surgery. He cut the man open and pulled out his small intestine. His body was filled with some unknown black substance. He saw the tall man cut the remaining organs from the man before the video ended. Even for a horror movie, it was pretty disgusting, Michael thought. Something about the video was making his head pound. He went downstairs to get some water. As he was filling a cup over the sink, he vomited. It was the same black substance from the video. It tasted of rot and decay. He crawled upstairs and into bed. He hoped that he could sleep off whatever was going on. Another nightmare greeted him that night. He saw the doctors but also he saw the lifeless bodies of the victims. They were all hung along the wall. There were so many of them. More than he'd be able to count, as he could only move his head so little at the moment. His eyes finally landed on the man that he'd seen in the video. He appeared to be able to talk, and what he said was, Don't let the doctor find you. Michael awoke, sobbing. He couldn't calm himself down. Everything he tried just made it worse. He was in a perpetual state of anxiety as his body pulsated and throbbed. He turned over to check the time on his alarm. It had been five days. He had been asleep for five whole days. He called out for Brian. He definitely needed to go to the hospital. There was no answer. He called out again, but still nothing in return. Michael struggled to get to his feet and walked to his roommate's room. Nothing. It was empty. He tried to call for an ambulance, but all he got was static on the other end. There was a ringing from the house phone. The person on the other end was Angela. She explained that she came over looking for Brian, but only found Michael sleeping. She hasn't heard from him in five days. He's missed work and school. Michael asked her to call an ambulance for him, but the phone cut out again before he could finish his request. Michael was running out of options. He ran back to his room. He was going to use his laptop to contact someone, anyone. When he started up his laptop, the Morbus.avi video started playing. He tried to stop it, but his body went numb. He was forced to watch it. A person was pulled in on the stretcher again, and they pulled back the sheet like they did before. On the stretcher was Brian. The tall man repeated his phrase and mutilated him like he did all the others. Michael was crying, but still unable to look away. Michael tried to get up from his desk, but all he could do was vomit and fall to the ground. He fell unconscious, with the fear that he'd never wake up. He did wake up though, but with the taste of leather in his mouth. He was there, in the room from Morbus. Standing above him was the tall man in the plague doctor's mask. It was all starting to make sense to him. The phrase the tall man was saying, the video, the black substance. He was infected. The video had acted as a virus after all, just not a computer one. He was infected, and now he's going to be purged from this world. Morbus.avi is a story that really tells you everything just based on the title. The focus on the plague doctors and the black death was interesting, and I liked how the video was used to spread the plague. The story relied a bit too much on Gore, and I'm not sure why he didn't call an ambulance sooner. The first time he vomited black goo should have been the only time that needed to happen. Not much to say, other than I liked it. On to the next one.
Don't Turn Off the Webcam has a story written anonymously and uploaded the wiki in 2012. The story starts with an unnamed narrator saying that he'd met the love of his life, a girl named Lynn, who he met while working at an event in Portland. The two lived pretty far apart, but started a relationship that day. The long distance relationship was hard, but they found ways to make it work. Lynn was living with her very traditional father, so the narrator had never actually been to her house in Washington. Eventually she bought Lynn a webcam that she could attach to her laptop. This way they could talk more intimately. It would help them bridge that gap until they could see each other more often once they both completed college. In 2010, Lynn's father passed away in his sleep. After attending his funeral in Florida, the two decided that they would finally meet at her house. She was all alone in the house now, as she'd lost both of her parents. It was just her and her dog there now. The two agreed to meet after their finals. During that week, the two were using their webcams to communicate more and more. During one late night, Lynn was telling the narrator about how her father had been acting strange the few days before he passed. He was putting up religious items and being rather watchful of her. As she's telling him this, she asks him to make her a promise. She asks him to not turn off the webcam, as having him there is the closest thing she has to family. He loved her, so he obliged. A few days later, while the two were communicating over webcam, the narrator fell asleep. He awoke a few hours later to see that Lynn was also now asleep. The laptop was in his dying room, so he left it on and slinked off to bed. He was awoken from his sleep by a phone call. It was Lynn, saying she had a nightmare. He talked to her about it and reminded her that they had a big day the next day. She laughed and reminded him not to forget something. The phone cut out as she was talking. This was normal for her since she had a garbage flip phone. The narrator tried to call a few times, but each time it would go to voicemail. Her phone really needed to be replaced. He went downstairs to grab a drink of water and saw his girlfriend and her dog staring at him through the webcam. He walked over smiling and waved at the two. She smiled back and the narrator noticed something in the background of the shot. There was some dark form in the background staring at her with malice. Two hours later, the narrator woke up on his kitchen floor. This wasn't the first time this has happened as he had blackouts when he was under heavy stress. The sight of whatever he saw must have caused one. He looked at the computer screen and saw Lynn lying face down. She didn't look up at him, but her hand reached over for her phone and started typing. The messages were being sent to him. They read, Don't turn off the webcam. Each message was sent one at a time. The narrator looked back over the laptop and saw something was crawling over towards Lynn. It stayed over her for a second before crawling towards the webcam. There was something appearing on screen. It had long, wet, stringy hair, and it seemed to be crawling through the webcam or attempting to. He ran over to the laptop, shut it closed, and threw it against the wall. He stomped on it a few times before starting to cry. He grabbed his phone and a bottle of wine and sat on the floor. His phone started to ring. It was Lynn, but he couldn't bring himself to answer it. After sitting on the floor for a while, he decided to call her back, but all he got was voicemail. The narrator woke up the next morning on his floor. He had passed out with a now empty bottle of wine in hand. He checked his phone and saw that he had one voicemail. He clicked on it and heard Lynn's terrified voice. You promised you wouldn't turn off your webcam. The narrator says that two years have passed since that night. He hasn't seen or heard from Lynn since. He's too afraid to look her up or go to see what happened to her. This is one of those stories that I remember being shared around by people that I knew. It was sent to me by a friend that knew I liked ghost stories. The way the story is told is a little slow in the beginning, with the narrator constantly mentioning how much he loves Lynn. It does take a really creepy turn, but I feel like it could have been more. The ghost trying to enter his home through the webcam is pretty unique though. Amazon Ultra is a creepypasta written and uploaded to the wiki by Stex85. The story is a man talking about a new Amazon service he was being advertised. It was called Amazon Ultra, and it came with all the perks of Amazon Prime and a few extras. More movies, more music, and faster deliveries by drone. The narrator's wife wasn't interested and thought that the drone thing was kind of weird. He told her that he'd sign her up for an account later, and she could decide then. The service was great so far, with it bringing things he was running out of and even things he might need later. They did this by reading the data offered through the app. He also had to give up his accounts for Facebook, Twitter, and Google. The drones would fly in, give him whatever he needed, require him to click the green button on them, and then they'd fly off. They were so efficient, he was even receiving items he didn't know he needed yet. This included toothpaste, a pack of beer, and a Blu-ray for when his wife was heading out of town for a business trip. 
The day after the trip, he'd received an Amazon Ultra package. It was stated to be for his wife. Inside the box was a butcher's knife. Now, his wife didn't cook, so there's no way that it was for her. He pressed the return button and the drone flew away, easy as could be. Over the next couple days, he would receive weirder and weirder packages. He received rat poison, but they have no rats. He also received women's black gloves and duct tape, neither of which they needed. It was becoming more and more clear that his wife was planning to kill him when she got back. The items couldn't be delivered anywhere but the home they were assigned to. The day that his wife was set to return had arrived. He awoke that morning feeling groggy and unwell. At the foot of his bed was a drone. He looked at the box it held and saw something shiny, a barrel of a gun. She really was going to kill him, and after everything he'd done for her. The narrator could hear his wife's voice as she returned home. As she entered the room, he went into a fit of rage, claiming that she was seeing someone else and that she wanted to kill him. She laughed, clearly no idea what he was talking about. A hammer had been delivered from a drone and placed it in his hand. He swung at her. Watching the smile on her face turn to fear as she slumped back and eventually fell through the window. She wasn't going to be able to kill him if he did it first. That's when the thought came to him. He never did get around to making her an account. A pretty dark story that was kind of cartoony at times. Like when the wife falls out of the window, two drones are just there putting down a trampoline, or the fact that the drones dropped a hammer into his hands at the perfect time for him to commit the murder. It was more like dark comedy than horror, but I liked it nonetheless. It was clear that the drones or Amazon Ultra were the ones setting up this whole thing. They wanted him to kill his wife for some reason. Sleepwatchers.net is a two-part story that was shared to the No Sleep subreddit. The story is written by Wishbone43 and tells the story of a weird website. The goal of the site is for people to be watched while they sleep so someone could keep them company. The narrator, Oliver, starts by saying that he has just graduated high school. He is both elated and saddened. Not because high school ended, but because he was never prepared for the life that he was expected to lead after. The goal for money to sustain oneself wasn't taught to him at school. That's when he was introduced to a website called sleepwatchers.net, a website where you get paid to watch someone sleep through the night. This was done in order to keep them company and make them feel less lonely. The main clientele appeared to be older folks. Oliver's friend Manny was the one that told him about the site. The two signed up together and were ecstatic when they saw how much they made per night. After signing up, he was immediately met with the sleeper who was requesting him. Viola was her name, an older woman that had recently lost her husband. She was having a hard time sleeping, discovering she had a new case of insomnia. She greeted Ollie and was happy to have him as her watcher. He was also happy to help her as he truly felt sorry for her and she was very nice. Before he began his first night of sleep watching, he was greeted with the rules of each night of work. 1. Do not fall asleep. 2. For no circumstances may you wake the sleeper. 3. Do not touch the red emergency button unless there is an emergency. 4. Do not fall asleep. It was weird they listed the first rule twice, but he didn't think much of it. It was the easiest job in the world, at least on the surface. You only had to watch the sleeper through their webcam, but you were allowed to do anything else you wanted, as long as you were watching. This meant that nights were filled with random internet searches, playing online games, and watching videos. Just as long as they didn't wake Viola, there was no issue. It appeared to be a real easy job. It had been a solid three nights of watching and a solid three nights of no issues. That was until one night there was a change in the routine. Viola had woken up around 3 a.m. She smiled at the camera and continued to the bathroom. Ollie looked past her bed and saw something. It looked like a long, pale hand was moving behind a curtain. As Viola returned to the room and laid back down, the hand was gone. Ollie chalked it all up to being a bit tired that night. He wasn't going to fall asleep, but he definitely needed to sleep better when he did. There was nothing weird or off about the rest of the night. A few nights after this, the incident occurred. Ollie had fallen asleep. It was for an hour or so. When he woke back up, Viola was lying in her bed. For a few minutes, it all seemed okay, until a tall figure that had bright white eyes stepped out of the darkness of the corner of the room. The figure floated over to where Viola was sleeping and loomed over her. This is when Ollie broke the second rule and yelled for Viola to wake up. She did so and the figure immediately started punching her to death. She cried out but nothing could be done. He continued to punch her until his fist turned from the ghostly white to a crimson red. There was nothing that Ollie could do, even the emergency button on the site did nothing. It kept giving him an error message stating that he was locked out because he broke the rules. Now he should just sit back and watch her die. The figure turned towards the camera and looked straight at Ollie. It's all your fault, it said. It stood there for a while. 
Ollie couldn't look away. He hasn't slept since that night. It's been five days since then. He is losing his mind. He just can't bring himself to sleep because he knows that it's coming for him next. This was the ending of part one of the story. It's a pretty interesting story on its own. A mysterious website that kills you for breaking the rules. Well, more like it kills the sleeper. So the person who breaks the rules kills them both. Part two would follow closely to the story and actually uses the original post as part of its canon events. Ollie's friend, Manuel, is also a watcher. He was a friend who signed up first and convinced Ollie to try out the site. Manny has his first sleeper requested to him, a war vet by the name of Dominique. The two quickly became friends as Manny would listen to all of his war stories. It was clear the older man had PTSD, but he still wanted to remember the war and maybe talking about it helped alleviate some of the guilt. After all this, he explains that he saw Ollie's post on Reddit. It had caught his attention since there were very few posts talking about Watchers.net. He wasn't sure what to think of the post at first. He figured that Ollie had made the whole thing up, likely from boredom. He was the type. Realizing he hadn't talked to him in some time, Manny sends him a message. A response came very quickly. All it said was, watch me. It was a strange request, but he remembered the story. Maybe he was just messing with him, but either way, he accepted his request. So starting that night, he was now watching two different sleepers at the same time. One being Dominique, the other Ollie. Dominique had told him to be wary of Ollie. It was as if he knew something but wasn't willing to share it. The nights were progressing normally. Manny would watch Dominique first, usually by an hour, then start watching for Ollie. Ollie would always start every session by just staring into the webcam. He wouldn't say anything or respond. That was until he was about to sleep, which he would declare, and then climb into bed. This went on for a week, and with each passing day, Ollie would start to act more and more like his old self. He was even making jokes. It seemed that maybe he'd been tired this whole time. He just needed some peace of mind. Following a poor decision by Manny to stay up during the day, the night came that he would soon figure out if the story was fake or not. He had wanted to spend time with his friends, and so skipped out on sleep for one day. It wasn't the best plan, but he just wanted to enjoy a little time with his friends before they left for college. That night, as he was watching both Ollie and Dominique, he fell asleep. It wasn't for very long, maybe half an hour at most. It didn't matter. He woke up to find Ollie gone. His bed was completely empty and the other cam feed showed that Dominique was still sleeping soundly. A grip was felt around his neck, and the voice of a former friend echoed in his ear. You fell asleep, Ollie said, but no, it didn't sound like Ollie. His grip was so strong that there was no way that he could break it. He didn't remember his friend being this strong. I had to punish you, it said. Manny was punched and everything went black immediately. Manny woke up to see Dominique's room on his monitor, and in it was Ollie. He looked different. Now a tall, lanky figure standing in the shadow of Dominique's room. He wore a smile that appeared to stretch from ear to ear. He couldn't believe it was really him, but knew that it was. He looked just like the figure described in the story. Ollie proceeded to float over to the old man's sleeping form and proceeded to punch him to death, starting with his head, then moving to the rest of his body. Manny could only watch in horror as this kind old man was beaten to death, for him breaking the rules. Manny called the police and told them about Dom's death. They took his laptop in order to find any clues about the killer's whereabouts. While doing this, they left a single policeman to watch Manny's house in case the killer came back. Even with the small semblance of safety, Manny knew that the second he fell asleep, it would all come to an end. He urges anyone reading to never go seeking out this website. Do not go to sleepwatchers.net. This was kind of a long story since it was told in two parts anyway. It definitely feels like a more complete story with both parts. The concept is another that I find myself enjoying. Webcam horror is such a small niche that I feel it hasn't been properly explored yet. There's so many possibilities, and I'm excited to see what people come up with next. Stolen Laptop is a story that was posted on 4chan sometime in 2013. The story was later uploaded to the Creepypasta wiki. It's not too long of a story, but it does get across what it needs to very quickly. The story starts with a post on X. It starts, Hey X, I need some advice. I know this isn't technically paranormal, but it's creepy as hell, and I'm not sure what to do. I go to college in the northwestern United States, and a few weeks ago, during a party I was at, I stole a laptop and an iPod. I don't need to hear about how bad a person I am for stealing. Yeah, I know, and that's not going to help me out now. I have occasionally stolen technology in the past to sell at pawn shops and stuff. I'm pretty good with computers, so I can usually circumvent their passwords and stuff and sell them as if they were my own. Anyway, the computer I stole had some messed up stuff on it, like some stuff that makes me feel like I stole from an actual violent and crazy person. I don't want to be too specific in case they or someone they know is on here. 
I'm pretty nervous about the whole thing. But my question is, does anyone know how to break into a true crypt file? Is it even possible? There's one on here and I'm not even sure if I want to know what's on here after the crazy stuff I found that wasn't even password protected. OP goes on to explain that he likes to go through a person's files before deleting everything and selling the laptop. There's a bit of a thrill when it comes to seeing things you aren't meant to see. This is what he'd done with every other laptop he'd stolen or found. OP wants to go to the police, but he's worried that he'll have to explain how he got the laptop. He doesn't want this to lead back to him in any way. He's actually afraid of the person for what they'd been doing in these videos. The computer was filled with gore. A lot of it was stuff you could find online, but there were videos on it that suggested he made his own stuff too. There was a video of him killing an animal and self-mutilation. Needless to say, OP didn't want this person coming after him. There's also videos that are encrypted using TrueCrypt. If these abhorrent videos were so easy for him to find, what did he find necessary to hide behind an encryption? The story ends with the OP asking for advice on the matter. He also asks if there's any way to break the encryption, though he's not sure he wants to find out what this guy bothered to encrypt. This is a story that feels like it could be true. Whether it is or isn't, well, I couldn't tell you. Something posted on 4chan over a decade ago might be hard to find any information on now, especially with how little people were archiving things back then. The story really fills you with dread as you can relate to OP. He found something he shouldn't and doesn't know what to do with the thing. Taking it to the police is always the best bet. If the video is trying to be fake, you get slapped with a fine, but if they're real, then maybe you save someone's life further down the line. There's a morbid curiosity to the videos themselves, especially whatever could be hiding behind the encryption. What depraved actions need to be encrypted when the others weren't? It's a solid mystery, but one that I'm not sure we are ever going to be ready to solve. I went to the address on my fake ID as a story that was uploaded to the Creepypasta wiki in 2020. The story was uploaded by user Jake Wick. The story starts by saying that it's a written confession obtained by the FBI, and so reader discretion is advised. The actual story begins with our narrator, Jake Dalton, talking about a fake ID that he and his friends were buying online. The website was named idlord.com and was hosted in China, he thinks. It was a site that was advertising a group deal for fake IDs which was essentially half off their original prices. Jake and his friends went ahead and ordered them at 60 bucks a piece. This was better than the 120 it would cost normally. The fake IDs had a few requirements though. The person would use their real first name, but a fake last name. This is how Jake Dalton became Jake Norman. The age on the ID should be 21, since that's a completely normal age to be, and going too high might raise suspicion. The IDs need a picture, and the buyer needed to provide it, just take a decent picture with good and even lighting. This was followed by the signature, which didn't need to be anything special. Just remember to make the last name your fake last name. The final piece was the fake address. According to Jake, the best way to do this part was to use the same numbers for your normal address. Then you could use any fake street name that you wanted. This would make it easier to not forget the whole thing if someone starts asking too many questions. After all that is done, Jake eagerly awaits his fake ID. When it arrives, he sees that it looks almost real. The address line was pretty close to him as well, just a different state and street name. It was exactly what he needed to get into the bars and clubs in the area. After a night of drinking, Jake and his friend Sam are sitting in his living room, slightly hungover. They had a pretty good night and were killing time watching YouTube and reading through 4chan posts. Then something caught their eye. There was a 4chan post about idlord.com. It piqued their interest, and they started reading the thread. It was mostly filled with the usual that you'd expect. Some people were complaining about minor issues with the IDs, while others were praising them for how real they looked and how effective they were. Some were in between, but most picked the latter. They continued down the thread until they saw something unusual. People were claiming that the addresses on the fake IDs were real. This was illegal, but so was the whole operation. The posters continued, saying that they'd found stuff at the locations on their fake IDs. This was mainly money, which was something that neither of the boys could really pass up. The address was one state over in Tennessee. It wouldn't be that long of a drive for the two. They could easily make it there and back before dinner, if they drove straight there. This was enough convincing for Jake to get his car started with Sam and passenger. A few hours later, Jake and Sam had arrived at their destination. 
It looked like a home in the poorer side of town. The house looked abandoned with tall weeds in the front yard as well as a giant oak in the back. The whole place was surrounded by a chain link fence. None of this bothered the two as they got out of their car and raced up the path to the front door. It wasn't locked which was lucky or ominous. It seemed to be inviting them in. The house that is. Once inside they saw that it was fully furnished which was a surprise. The outside looked so run down that they'd expected it to be empty. Even with the furniture, everything was still caked in a layer of dust. A dust that doesn't settle in a lived in place. So it was likely abandoned or at least had been some time since the owners had been home. The two took pause but then remembered why they were there. They started to ransack the house, looking for the money. They flipped the furniture, put holes in the walls, and even tore up some of the carpet. There was nothing in the home, nothing of value at least. Jake turned to his friend and motioned that they should just leave. As the two turned towards the door, a faint noise could be heard. It sounded like a TV was on somewhere in the home. This spooked them, but not enough for them to leave. They decided to instead check out the direction of the sound. The staircase led to a room that they hadn't checked yet. Jake pushed open the door, apologizing for intruding. Inside the room, they found nothing but the TV. An ad was playing. It was an ad for ID Lord. The ad played and the two just shared confused looks. It was all starting to really get to them. Sam signaled to Jake that it was time to go. They turned around and there he stood. Actually, it would be more accurate to say there Jake stood. Only, it wasn't Jake. It looked like him, very closely. Though there was something very off about him. He wore the same clothes that Jake had on for his fake ID photo. It was all the same down to the same smile he'd made. Except this version wore the half smile like it was his normal face. Jake asked who he was and he told him. I'm Jake Norman. The doppelganger continued. I was going to pay you a visit tonight, but you came to me. Jake and Sam stood in a stunned silence before the other Jake lunged at Sam. It jumped on him so fast that he couldn't be avoided. The fake Jake started to bite into Sam's throat, causing him to scream. Jake tried to pull him off, but it was of no use. Jake turned and started to run as the gurgles of Sam echoed in the old home. He turned to see the fake bend and contort into a spider-like pose and then crawl at him. It was faster than any human should be on all fours. Jake made it down the stairs and into his car. As he started the ignition, the face of the fake Jake slammed into his window. He started to lick the window with the blood from his lips visible. Jake was able to get the car going and sped out of the area before he could be pursued. Jake immediately went to the cops and told them everything. They searched the house, but didn't find anything. No blood, no body, no monster. Jake was suspected in the disappearance of his friend, but later was exonerated. None of that matters to him, though, because he knows that Jake Norman is out there, and he would have been safer in prison. This story feels like I took inspiration from a few different stories that I've read over the years. I really like the concept, especially the monster doppelganger. Stories like Tulpa have been a favorite of mine since reading it many years ago. The pacing was fine, a little slow to start, and then fast near the end. It feels like this is a story that needs a sequel, or at least could do one. Following other people that have experienced this company, and what their goal might be. ID Lord is a major part of the story, but other than the name, and the creepy ad, there's not much to know about them. The minuscule amount of body horror was also welcome. Stories that have characters that contort always creep me out. Overall, this is a story that I really liked. If it had come out a few years sooner, it might even appear in a top 10 list or two. Thanks for being an organ donor is a story that revolves around a very familiar idea. The story was uploaded in 2018 to the Creepypasta Wiki and written by RL Knight one The story was mildly popular and is one that has stuck with me since reading it back in 2018. The narrator of this story is a girl named Steph. She starts by saying that her friend Kimberly is extremely naive and trustworthy. She falls for just about every scam under the sun. She's won three foreign lotteries, paid money to the Internal Money Service IMS, and even replied to a few Nigerian princes. Essentially, she was a scammer's dream come true. Since this was the case, Steph became her financial advisor, so to speak. She would take care to keep the girl out of trouble and check her email for any frauds and spam coming her way. One day, a strange email graced her inbox. It was Christmas break, but neither girl had gone home for the holidays. 
leaving them to a mostly empty dorm. The email in question had a really weird subject line. It read, Thank you for being an organ donor. The email continued, Thank you for choosing to become an organ donor. There is currently a demand for the following. Skin and eyes. Your contribution is very much appreciated. We will be in touch. It was a weird email for multiple reasons, but mainly because it was requesting specific organs from her. Of course, Kimberly was an organ donor. She wouldn't need them after she died. But why were they emailing her when she was still alive? Steph asked if maybe she'd responded to any weird emails lately or been signed up for updates on anything. Kimberly answered no, and there just didn't seem to be a reason for the email that the two could come up with. The final thought was to check to see if maybe she was part of some new scam. Steph looked online but couldn't find anything connected to the email. There was only one search result, really, and that was how to write a thank you card to an organ donor's family. Putting aside the strangeness of the email, they decided to reply asking to be removed from the list. With that out of her mind, Steph left for a date she had that night. She was out for most of the evening and finally returned pretty late. When she arrived back at her dorm, she found that the door was slightly cracked. This wasn't an immediate out-of-place occurrence as Kimberly was known for being a bit forgetful, and this included leaving the door unlocked or even open at times. She made her way into the dorm room and yelled that Kim had forgotten to close the door again. She stopped in the hall when she hadn't gotten a response. She called out again and walked through the silent dorm until she saw her. Lying on the floor was the body of Kim, completely flayed of her skin. She felt like she was going to vomit. Everything seemed to spiral for a moment before she was brought back to reality by the sound of her phone hitting the floor. She ran out of the dorm room, screaming and yelling, but not a single door budged. Steph soon found herself at the door of the school security office. She banged on the door until a man opened up. He asked her what was wrong and she tried to explain everything to him, but it was coming off as a jumble of words and she needed to calm down. Eventually, she was able to get the words out as the security guard sat her down in his office. He said that he was sorry to hear about what happened and made direct eye contact with her. It was probably supposed to be comforting, but it felt anything but. He said that he would go and secure the crime scene and call the police. She just needed to stay put in the office and remain calm. The guard then told her he needed to take a picture of her for the standard procedure. She agreed and he took a few photos of her face before grabbing his stuff and leaving. Steph started to meander around the office, trying to keep herself preoccupied. That's when she noticed that the security guard's computer was turned on. Her curiosity got the best of her and she started to look to see what he had open. That's when a new email message popped up on the corner of the screen. The title of the message read, Re, thanks for B, and then trailed off. Steph already knew what to expect. She opened his email and saw multiple messages. Thanks for being an organ donor was sent to multiple names. Each one was listed next to the email subject. The final email was to Kim, her roommate. A beeping sound suddenly pulled her from her shocked state. Her phone. She reached for it. She needed to call the police now. Only, there was no phone in her pocket. She dropped it on the floor earlier. The beeping sound continued. It wasn't her phone. She followed the sound to an electrical closet. She opened the doors and saw an amalgamation of horror. The body parts of several girls had been crudely stitched together to create a person. The skin was perfect, just like that of her roommates. Steph wanted to cry, but something stopped her. In the hand of the stitched girl was a phone. She slowly reached over and grabbed it. There was a few messages coming in. The final string of messages read, Hey babe, take a look at this. An image of Steph appeared in the thread. I found the perfect set of eyes for you. Thanks for being an organ donor is a fun read of a creepy pasta. It has some chilling imagery, a good setup, and is well written. The idea of a Frankenstein's monster being created from the body parts of girls is actually not a new concept. It was done in several pieces of media, books, TV shows, and a few other stories. I like the premise, but the ending kind of loses me. Throughout the story, it's written as if she's telling us what is happening right in the present moment, but the story ends ambiguously, without us knowing how she was able to actually tell us the story. This is kind of a weird plot hole that a lot of these stories seem to fall into. I guess she could have written this story on his laptop and posted it somewhere, but that would take a while, and she could just run at that point. Or she could have tried to contact the police through the computer. I don't mind this disconnect in stories, as I believe a little bit of suspension of disbelief is needed for most horror content. I will say this story held my interest, and I could recommend it for any night where you need a little bit of a scare. Sky Judge is a story that originates from 4chan's X board. The story was posted in 2011 and was a story I found to be pretty creepy and atmospheric. Here's the post in full. 
In recent years, airlines have started installing video cameras on their planes. For security reasons, of course. There are usually several cameras recording footage from several areas around the plane. Flight attendants view the video feeds on a console that lets them switch between camera views. It's not high quality, 10 frames per second or so at low resolution, but it's better than nothing. There is a particular video being passed around file sharing networks that appears, if it's not a hoax, to be taken from an airplane security camera. The file is often called recovered underscore crash underscore footage, or similar file names but the most common title is SkyJudge. The video appears to be reconstructed from incomplete corrupted data, leaving occasional gaps and jumps. It shows a grainy view of the passenger compartment of an airplane, tentatively identified as a Boeing 787. The camera is mounted in the rear of the passenger compartment, facing forward, giving a view of about half of the seats. In the lower right of the video is a timestamp tracking the action in seconds. This summary is written with those timestamps in mind, not the video's running time. Know that the video does not have sound. 7, 3, 2, 13. Video begins. The plane is about half full of passengers, all of them seated at this time. Blue sky can be seen out the window, with sunlight at a somewhat shallow angle. 7, 47, 45. Man in a business suit rises from his seat and begins walking to the back of plane. 7, 47, 56. Man in business suit vanishes off bottom of screen. 7.53.23 Flight attendants can be seen pushing beverage carts from front of plane. They begin serving passengers drinks. 7.59.54 Corrupted video for a moment. 8.09.33 Video returns with a timestamp 10 minutes later. Flight attendants have made their way further along the aisle, but they're still visible. Man in business suit is back in his seat. 8.10.10 one attendant pours a glass of V8 brand tomato juice from a can. She hands this glass to a woman in a purple dress. As she does, a red flash can be seen from the left windows, moving forward, the same direction the aircraft is flying. No one notices this flash. 81032. A young boy in a window seat, estimated five years old, unbuckles his seatbelt and stands up, pressing his hands to the window and looking out. The woman next to him speaks sharply to him finally pulling him down into the seat and forcing him to buckle his seatbelt. No one else reacts to this. 8-12-01. Corrupted video. 8-33. Unknown. When the video comes back, it continues to be glitchy. The video twists and stutters, sometimes looking like two feeds superimposed. Sometimes the seat appears to be empty. Sometimes the plane appears to be completely full of passengers. 8-34. There's one particularly bad glitch at this point. Then the feed returns with the given timestamp. The passenger compartment appearing just as it did earlier. The flight attendants are no longer visible, but all the passengers are. Some viewers have reported seeing a face in the corrupted video, variously described as moaning or in pain. 8.44.22 Flight attendants appear pushing a beverage cart. They begin serving drinks. 8.45.51 A couple of frames of static, then the feed returns. Only the scene has a distinct red cast. This lasts for several seconds. 8.45.59 Static, then feed returns with normal coloring. 8.47.19 The man in the business suit gets up from his seat. 8.47.21 Static. 8.47.24 Feed returns with the given timestamp. The man in the business suit is no longer visible. 8.54.18 Flight attendant pours drinks from unidentified can and hands it to the woman in the purple dress. Then there are several frames of corrupted video. 854.18. Video returns to show a flight attendant still in the act of handing over a drink. However, careful searching reveals the young boy who looked out the window is no longer visible. The woman next to him seems unchanged. 904.28. Flight attendants vanished off bottom of screen. 906.41. Corrupted video, then feed returns with red cast. 906.43. Corrupted video, then more red. A man's body can be seen near the front of the plane, apparently hanging from a noose. 906.44 Corrupted video, normal feed returns. 908.52 Corrupted video, for several seconds, there appears to be footage of the passengers out of their seats, fighting each other with bare hands. 908.54 Normal feed returns. Man in business suit is once again in his seat. 913.11 Flight attendant appears from the front of the plane, pushing a beverage cart. 913.15 Flight attendants vanish. 
A figure in a black robe moves into view from the back of the plane. It walks towards the front, hood hiding its head. 9 13 17. Hooded figure vanishes, flight attendants reappear. This switching repeats every one to two seconds. The figure moving to the front attendants to the rear. They flicker in and out of existence, at one point even appearing to move through each other. 9 13 29. Hooded figure and flight attendants vanish. 9 13 36. Corrupted video for several seconds. Face appears, very clear this time. Then feed with red light shining through the windows, then normal feed as previous. 9 13 39. Corrupted video for roughly half a second. 9 13 43. Feed returns with later timestamp. Flight attendants and beverage cart are once again visible. 9 13 47. Flight attendant holds out a cup to the woman in the purple dress. The attendant holds a knife to her own wrist and moves it. 9 13 48. Several seconds of corrupted video. Views of flames. Red face, often described as demonic. 10 17 01. All the passengers are standing up, waving their arms, appearing to shout violently. The hooded figure is near the front of the plane, floating above the ground, face and shoulders past the top of the video frame. Below him in the aisle, a woman's body lays, tentatively identified as the woman sitting next to the young boy. Her clothes are bloody. She is face down, shaking. 10 17 03. Corrupted video. Feed returns for just a moment showing passengers sitting in their seats, slumped and unmoving, many displaying violent injuries. Only three seconds of this is visible. 11 33 Normal feed returns, but no passengers are visible. Plane is completely empty. 11 44 Red light shines in through windows, steadily brightening. After several seconds, the light is so intense, the entire feed is white. A second later, the feed ends. The Dead Internet Theory is a story written by Weird Bryce Guy on Reddit's No Sleep Board. The story was uploaded in February of 2022 and received a decent amount of upvotes. The story isn't related to the actual Dead Internet Theory, which I was going to cover in this iceberg but decided to leave for my rabbit hole series. The story starts with a man explaining that he doesn't believe the world is as it presents itself. He believes that the actual number of real people on the planet is substantially lower than what we're told. 7 billion is the number he gives. That's what we are told is the number of people living on this planet. He believes it's actually half of that number, or even less. Half of the humans on this planet are real people with real lives, he believes. The other half are pre-programmed bots that live among us for one reason or another. They exist only to fill up the empty spaces in our world. This whole idea stems from something that happened while waiting in line to get coffee. As he was picking out a table, he saw a girl across the way holding up her phone and clearly recording herself. She was likely streaming or recording for some social media site. The act itself wasn't odd. There are millions of streamers and content creators out there, but it was how she was doing it. Everything seemed theatrical, but practiced, which was even odder when the man walked by her and glanced at her screen. It was blank, like it wasn't even on. The girl was essentially broadcasting to no one, just pretending to be. Sitting down, he was perplexed by what was happening. He would occasionally glance over and see nothing on her screen but she would keep talking to it or smiling and moving. It was as if she was acting. After a while of sitting in silence, the narrator finally politely asks her what her username is and what platform she's streaming on. He worded it like he thought he'd seen her content before. She put a finger to her phone as if to say one second and leaned over to answer his question. You know the one, right? This was the weirdest way of answering a straightforward question. Not only because she never answered what her username was, she never stated the platform that she was using, when there are so many that she could be using, Twitch, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, or any of the others. She just assumed that he already knew, or maybe she was asking the question herself, like she needed him to fill in the blank. Following this interaction, the narrator nodded to the girl as if he knew and left. He couldn't shake the fight or flight feeling he got from that interaction though. He decided he would do a little investigating. Being as discreet as possible, the man started to watch people, he would look at their phones, at their actions, and the way they interacted with others. There was a pattern emerging. Many people of different races, sexes, fashion senses, and even ages were all similarly acting like the girl from before. He didn't even need to see their phones to know if they were bot-like. They just became uncanny to him. Everything about them was easy for him to find a fault with. They all seemed to be inhuman. It was starting to freak him out, so he headed home. Entering his house, his roommate met him at the door. 
Apparently he'd forgotten they were supposed to go to the movies. He was late, since he spent so much time observing people. The narrator apologized and said that the coffee place had run out of milk. A lame excuse, but one that seemed to work. His roommate said that it was alright and asked if he wanted to see a movie at a later time. Something felt off about this interaction. It was plastered all over his face, and it finally hit him. His roommate was just like the girl at the coffee shop. Just like the people he'd observed outside. He was a bot. Before he could be sure, he wanted to test something. The narrator asked his roommate to pick a time as he was open to any. When the roommate pulled out his phone and started to search for times, the narrator casually recorded his screen. The roommate said he booked seats for them and the narrator thanked him for it. The narrator pulled out his phone and watched the video. The screen of his roommate's phone was completely blank. There was no way he could have picked out seats for them. With a bit of fear in his voice, he said that he had to go real quick. The roommate called out after him, Okay, I'll meet you at the theater. You know the one, right? The narrator has since moved out and is living with a friend, one that hasn't shown any of these odd behaviors. They are now sure of something. The internet isn't the only thing full of bots. Now I think this is a really well done story. Stories that present the world as some giant conspiracy are fun reads to me. String theory comes to mind. And like string theory, this one presents multiple ideas beyond the story. What if the world is secretly filled with bots? What is their reason for being? That's not fully explored in the story, and well, it doesn't really need to be. Just the idea present is enough. This also feels very similar to the Matrix Theory, which is a topic I covered in my last Darkest Internet Rabbit Holes video. The idea simply states that we live in a simulation. Here instead we live in a world full of bots. There's a portion of the Matrix Theory that states that only a certain number of people are actually playable characters, and the rest are NPCs. Putting that aside, the story is an interesting read, but it's not the most terrifying. It does present a very interesting idea about the nature of our world. It's a story that's more fun to discuss with others. I plan to delete my YouTube channel as a creepypasta that was uploaded to creepypasta.net in 2015. The story was written by Chloe Champ, and the narrator of the story is also named Chloe. Chloe runs a YouTube channel that mainly parodies popular TV shows. The channel was pretty popular, hitting 100,000 subscribers recently, so she thought it was time to do a thank you video for all those that subscribed. She made a 100k sub special and uploaded it expecting her fans to love it. It was a montage of herself doing silly things her fans had requested. It was essentially a fun suggested video to show thanks. The surprise came when she saw that her video was receiving more dislikes than likes. This was odd as it had never happened before. The like to dislike ratio was never this close. Her fans were fiercely loyal and this was a video made exactly to what they'd requested. Chloe sat down to watch her video on YouTube and saw that it was a different video entirely. The video she uploaded was 5 minutes long entitled Thank You. The video she saw on her channel was of a girl busily typing away at a computer. It was her. And the video was her editing the thank you video. The next day after classes, she was cleaning up her room and studying. She had decided to fix the video, but when she logged into her YouTube account, she saw that she had another video uploaded. The title was a timestamp, and the video showed her walking around her room doing normal everyday stuff. The video ended with her leaving her room to get food, most likely. Worried that a video of her changing or drying off after a shower would appear on her channel next, she started to go through her laptop. She feared that it was a virus recording her from her webcam and uploading it to her channel. She spent the better part of the evening trying to find anything, but there was nothing. She exhaustedly put a piece of paper in front of the webcam and went to bed. The next morning she awoke to a flood of comments. They were all asking the same thing. What was going on and what happened to her old content? There was a new video on her channel with another timestamp. The video was a black screen for an hour. The video was getting tons of views and she wasn't sure why. That was until she saw the timestamp posted in her comment section. At the 30 minute mark, she could vaguely see a shape in the darkness. It was her, lying on her bed in the complete darkness of the night. That didn't make sense, especially since she covered her camera and everything. That's when she saw something that she hadn't thought of before. The angle of the recording was from her bedroom window. Here's a creepypasta that is short but creepy. Someone had hacked into her YouTube account and was recording her and then uploading those videos online. It never goes deeper than that, which is fine since the premise alone is pretty creepy. The person doing this could be a crazy fan or someone she knows. The fact that we'll never know brings a pretty good amount of creep factor. There could have been a single comment that foreshadowed the ending. It would have added a little bit more to make the story better. Overall a fun read, be sure to check out the original story.
It has that classic creepypasta vibe that I can never get enough of. Email, or my life was ruined because of an email I should have never received, is a no sleep story. The story was posted in parts, with part one being posted in August of 2014. It was uploaded by Still Running and presents its story from the perspective of a man that's on the run. The first post details a man with a perfect life. He had a career, a new wife, and a puppy. He had just recently gotten a job as a teacher and was loving it. He and his wife had just gotten married and bought a new home with some land. It was all going so well until the night he'd received a weird email. The email in question was clearly sent to him by accident. The email address was pretty closely related to his, but just slightly off. The email detailed a new form of the Ebola virus, some company that wasn't listed in the email were making a new, harder to trace and harder to track version of the virus. It was clear they were working on a bioweapon, one that could turn into a pandemic. Reading the email, he wasn't sure what he should do. It was clearly a confidential email, but what could he really do? It was sent to him by accident. He quickly decided to download the files onto a USB drive, mark the email as unread, and move it to his trash folder. That night he wasn't able to sleep. The thought of the consequences of the email still stuck in his mind. He finally fell asleep, the next day heard knocking at his door. He went to check and saw two men in suits with sunglasses on. Your typical men in black type trope. They'd asked him if he'd received a strange email. He was able to lie to them about ever opening the email. He even showed them inside and logged into his email. There they saw that it was unopened, and he even deleted it in front of them. The two men thanked him for his time and left. He was relieved, but then realized that it had taken them less than 24 hours to find him. The contents of that email were far more severe and real than he'd imagined. He wouldn't be able to rest easy knowing that they knew of his existence. The narrator's suspicions turned out to be valid when random accidents kept popping up, ones that could easily have killed him and his wife. First, his tractor exploded, one of his two. Right as it did, he noticed a suspicious car driving by. Next, there was a carbon monoxide leak that could have been worse if he hadn't gotten a repairman to fix his heater so fast. His brakes had stopped working in his car, which he was able to slow down in time luckily to stop his car. The garage door had malfunctioned and almost crushed his dog. Next, there was a rare venomous snake found in his yard, one that was native to his state, but one that very rarely was in that area. These kept all piling up until he decided he needed to disappear, for the sake of his wife and for the sake of his life. He left with a series of tactics he'd employed to keep them from finding him. Now he posts his story to Reddit as he's tried everything else to get his story out. Every single person, news organization, or politician that he'd gone to had something pop up to discredit them. They even killed one person that was ready to go public with his info. No matter who he tried, they were snuffed out in one way or another. His final post was after he'd tried to contact WikiLeaks. The info never got to them, and now he was running again. There was nothing left for him to do but keep running. Nine years had passed since he had first started running, and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight. That's the story of email. I think the story is told really well, and I obviously cut out a lot because the story has a lot to tell. I highly recommend you look it up if you want to read a very well-written, no-sleep story. I can't say I was afraid all that much. I definitely felt connected to the writer in a way. There was an air of believability, and some not so much. It was interesting to hear about this man who was on the run, but the email itself being sent to him was what kind of took me out of the story a bit. Places that are working on projects like this wouldn't make this mistake, or you'd hope not. They would have their own email domain so as not to accidentally leak anything. Of course it has happened in the past, once or twice I'm sure. The story takes place in 2005 so maybe security protocols for organizations were more lax then. This part might be unrealistic, but so were some of the attempts on his life. If you can suspend your disbelief for a second, this story is really well written and worth your time. I'm kind of sad it didn't continue as I was getting into the narrative pretty heavily. Game of Tag was the Creepypasta of the Month winner of January 2019. The story was written by Kane Mack and was uploaded in 2017. The story has been pretty popular since its upload. The story starts by claiming that a certain video appeared on YouTube in 2017. The video depicted someone recording an incident from their phone. A rather large city has some sort of panic taking place. People are running and screaming. Much of the video is just people screaming. This continues until a girl in a green hoodie can be seen walking calmly alongside the people frantically running. She can only slightly be seen in the video, but she has her hood up and black hair covering part of her face. 
She might be smiling, but it's hard to tell from the video. A man walks up to her, asking if she knows what's going on. There was a subtitle on screen for this for some reason. The girl reaches out and touches the man's shoulder. He starts to convulse and falls to the ground, and his chest swells. The man's face goes completely red as he stops moving. The person holding the phone starts to curse and cry. The camera gets more shaky, but the video shows the girl walking over and touching more people as they all start to fall to the ground in the same manner. This continues for a while before she turns to the person holding the camera and smiles. That's where the video ends. The video sits at 6 million views as of the time of this writing. It has people from all over the world commenting on it. Some can't believe what they're seeing, while others say that it's clearly some marketing stunt for a movie. Others still leave trolling messages saying things like they can change her. The media outlets that have reported on her all stated that she was using some sort of syringe or chemical gas to inflict this sickness on those she came in contact with. They called it a chemical attack by a lone terrorist. It was clearly more than that, but they wouldn't budge on their stances. This wasn't the first time that the girl had appeared, or been recorded. There was another incident in 2011 in Japan. The same thing with the girl walking around and touching people. They all died from that one touch. The 2011 video was harder to find, but essentially went the same way. This girl in the green hoodie, or Rosie as the internet was starting to call her, was never anywhere to be found after the attacks. She always slipped in and out of the chaos. A subreddit was created to find anything and everything about her, but most of the leads led to the same places. To either of these videos, or to people with similar encounters. To this day, no one knows who or what Rosie is. All they know is that it takes one touch. One touch in your lungs will fill with mold exposure that could kill a large animal in seconds. Be wary of the girl in a green hoodie. A Game of Tag is a very good story that doesn't seem to know what it wants to do with its premise. The first four paragraphs paint a very interesting story of an anomalous entity that can kill you with just a touch. It almost feels like an SCP story, and it even makes mention to the organization in the story. Of course, the organization is presented as it is in reality, a work of fiction. The base premise of this girl walking around and killing all she touches is good. I like it, but the rest of the story is kind of filler. It doubles over itself a few times, just presenting the same story beat over and over. I'm going to be honest and say that I actually like this aspect, though, as it feels like someone trying to go deeper into this anomaly. Which, at the end of the day, is exactly what the story is trying to do. Even with its faults, I find it to be memorable as a story, and could be expanded upon or even added to the actual SCP Foundation. It almost feels like it could be expanded upon into a full story, one that I would gladly read. Anima is a creepypasta that was uploaded in 2014 to the Creepypasta Wiki. The story is credited to Zelrog T. Apocalypse, who has written a few stories posted on both this site and the Some Ordinary Gamers Wiki. The story focuses on a very strange file found on the narrator's computer. The narrator starts by saying that it was a pretty awful day for them. They'd gotten a parking ticket and a jury summons. These two things by themselves were awful, but they also returned home to find that their computer was also infected with some virus. They first noticed something was up when their computer was running slower than usual. It was a kind of sluggish pace that you noticed right away. It was odd since the computer was running normally the day prior. Digging into their computer files, they found that their hard drive was now full, when the day prior it had only 10% filled. They immediately thought of the scammers that fill your computer with garbage data and then charge you a fee to clean it for you. This was odd though since they hadn't received an attempted scam yet. No emails or anything. The narrator started a computer scan, then left to watch TV. A few hours of channel flipping, a familiar chime pulled them from their stupor. The computer had completed its scan, which hopefully meant good news. Of course, when they arrived at their computer, it was anything but. The scan came back clean, but a new file was found that couldn't be scanned. It was labeled weirdly. There were a few black boxes, and the file type was .anima. That was a new one that they'd never heard of before. This was likely the virus as it was even hidden in the System32 folder. The file was strange. Stranger still was everything found in the properties. All of the file information appeared to be corrupted, just a jumble of letters and numbers. The weirdest part, though, was the file size, or a lack thereof. It had no file size listed. This didn't make sense, since something was taking all of the available space on the computer. The narrator tried to delete the file, but they weren't allowed to. A text box popped up, saying that the file could not be deleted. Access was denied. They attempted it over and over, but got the same message. 
until finally they got a new text box on top of the old one. It simply said stop with two accompanied choices, yes and no. The narrator chose yes and the window went away. This virus needed to be researched, they decided. They went from website to website searching for a similar virus, but nothing turned up for Anima. The narrator slept on it and decided to call up a friend the next day. She was far more tech savvy and was able to help a little bit. In the end though, all it really did was give the narrator a few places to start their search. So they backed up their personal files and decided to test it the next day. The next day came and it was time to see what program would open the Anima file. It was clearly not a standalone file or it would have opened by simply double clicking it. The problem now was where to start. They could run it through every program on their computer if they wanted. First was running it in Notepad. This brought up a bunch of text with missing characters. Not only that, but it seemed to be an entirely different language. Next they tried running it in a photo viewer. This worked and it brought up a single suburban house, one that was clearly not somewhere in the US. They accidentally closed out of the viewer and reopened it. This time a new image appeared on screen. This was very odd, but interesting. This time the image was from the inside of a car driving on a brick road. The image was taken from the driver's perspective. That shouldn't be possible. You can't change the image that opens up when you open a file, right? It should always be the same image. The narrator opened it up again and got something different once again. This time it was a black background with letters from an alphabet they didn't recognize, but assumed was Russian. Every time they opened the file in the image viewer, it was something completely different. A grocery store, a theater, someone's living room. They continued to refresh the image until they got this. It was in English this time. It was clear someone was messing with them. The text had scared them at first. Get out is not something you ask, it's a demand, one that usually implies aggression. Feeling a bit unnerved, they decided to try the program in Windows Media Player. Doing so brought up an audio file. For some reason, the bar on the bottom never moved past the left side. The file length kept getting longer, but the bar never moved. What was heard was the sound of people talking in Russian. They closed out and tried again. This time it sounded like a family was having dinner. The clinking of plates and silverware could be heard. Alongside all of that was the voices speaking in Russian. For some reason, the narrator had the idea to try VLC Media Player out next. Not sure why, but it decided to open a video this time. The video showed a man sitting in an office working on paperwork. He would occasionally look at his computer screen and a reflection of him could be seen. It was the same man that had been seen in one of the images prior. After a while, VLC crashed. When the narrator tried to open it again, it would only display an error message. The message would repeat, stay out. There was another option for yes or no. Clicking no this time, a series of pop-ups started to crowd the screen. They were one after another. They all said, stay out, in all caps. This went on for a while until the narrator decided to click yes. In an instant, all the messages disappeared. It was as if they'd never clicked on it in the first place. This was getting irritating. They finally decided to try to delete the file again, which led to another message popping up, one that said, do not. After trying over and over to delete the file, which was taking up all the computer's processes at this point, they decided to go to their task manager. Inside the task manager, they found the process titled Anima. From here, the narrator was finally able to end the process with a final message reading, please no. Regardless, they clicked to end the process. The computer was back to normal. All processes and the speed was finally back to where it should be. A simple solution to a very strange issue. Even with the process dead, the file was still sitting on the computer. The narrator did another search into Anima and found something interesting. The word Anima translates into soul. A thought crossed their mind. Was the Anima file a person's soul? Were they seeing their memories? Had they just deleted someone? The narrator tried to open the file in Notepad again, but all they got was a blank document. Anima is a long creepypasta that I think suffers from over-explaining everything. The amount of fluff text that goes in describing every part of how the computer virus works is interesting, but a little much to read through. That said, I think the story has an interesting idea, but it wasn't really that scary. For these kinds of pastas, I like to put myself into a place to be scared even if the story is functionally not scary. I tried my hardest to find the horror in it. This one felt more sad than scary. It was still a pretty interesting story and I think it's worth a read if you enjoy the more techie side of computer-based creepypastas.
The Twitch stream is a story that was written by Connor Phillips and uploaded to NoSleep and Creepypasta.com. I couldn't find the original upload on Reddit, but saw it was uploaded in 2019 to Creepypasta.com. The story follows a Twitch streamer that never gives out their handle, but goes by the nickname D. He claims that he is one of the top streamers on the platform, getting around 20k viewers a stream. It took them six years, but they made a career out of it, and it was something they loved. This particular stream that they were recounting was one that he decided would be open to subs. This means that he would play games with subs for his stream. He would even let them decide what games they would play. This was easily one of his best streams, getting almost 50k viewers after playing Overwatch and then Dead by Daylight with two separate subs. His next sub that came on was a young boy, probably around 10, who wanted to play Minecraft. His name was Tanner and he kept calling the streamer D, which was his nickname that we established before. D started up Minecraft and was playing with the kid for a few minutes before a commotion could be heard over the mic. Tanner explained that some strange man was in his house, and he quickly ran into his room to hide. While taking over the mic, D could hear what sounded like shouting and screaming. D told Tanner to hide under his bed and that he would call the cops for him. The cops arrived and gunshots could be heard. Tanner confirmed that the man had shot the one cop that showed up. As all this was going on, the stream was going crazy and viewers kept showing up. D was on the phone with the police while Tanner was hiding. The man could be heard shouting that he was going to kill whoever was hiding from him. Tanner was told to run by D, but there was nowhere to run. His bedroom was in the basement with no windows. A SWAT team was called in, but it would take about 30 minutes for them to arrive. D kept trying to assure Tanner that he would be alright. Tanner just kept saying that he was scared but glad that he was talking to him. The whole time the intruder could be heard getting closer to the basement. There was a chorus of screams and then the sound of something falling to the floor. D screamed into the mic for Tanner. The next voice that came over the mic was Tanner's. He had tripped the guy coming down the stairs and then stabbed him with his own knife. Tanner was safe and the cops would arrive soon. D knew that the kid would never be the same. Not only had he heard his parents get murdered, but he also had to kill a man himself. It would be hard for him to lead a normal life now. This story is one that I remember reading years back and having a different opinion of then than I have now. The intro with the guy claiming to be a top streamer on Twitch with 20k average viewers is just a little bit much for me. It takes me right out of the story, especially since the streamers of 2019 were averaging only a bit higher than that number. I like stories that incorporate content creation stuff, but I prefer when they keep the scope realistic. That aside, the story is told in such a way that you really feel for the kid. I think the kid acts very much not like a kid in a few scenarios though. A 10 year old being able to stab and kill an intruder is rather unlikely. I don't think this is a bad story. It's written well and tells an engaging story that I think people will enjoy. The suspense is well written and it all flows well. It's worth checking out, but the ending also comes out of nowhere. There's a moment where Twitch chat goes silent and that never happens. It also says that people are attracted to a car crash or fire, which I can see, but none of that is played up in the story. It sounds like a Twitch streamer saving a kid's life by talking him through a life or death situation. There's hardly anything to do with a bunch of people being attracted to the dark events happening in the story. It feels weirdly jammed into an otherwise straightforward story. Don't Mind Me is a creepypasta that was written and uploaded in 2012 by Jessica2012. The story focuses on our narrator, who saved up enough money to finally buy a new laptop. One that had a webcam and mic perfect for doing business. The story opens with her telling us about her conspiracy theorist family. Everyone in the household, besides her, bought into every conspiracy theory they can get their hands on. From the world ending in 2012 to Obama being the Antichrist. Whatever was out there, they believed it. This leads to her brother, who used to try and bully her, telling the narrator that her laptop camera should be covered because someone could be watching her through it. She didn't believe that for a second, especially since he'd been telling her lies like this since they were kids. Something he would often say to her was not to leave the laptop open when she went to sleep. All of this just sounded like the usual conspiracy theory nonsense that she expected from her family. They wanted so hard for her to believe like they did. Recently, the narrator had been suffering from insomnia. In order to sleep, she needed a white noise machine. Every night, she would watch a bit of Hulu or Netflix, then turn on her laptop and place it on the nightstand. She would go to rainymood.com, shut off her screen light, and try her hardest to get a good night's sleep. Every night, without fail, she would have a nightmare. They were never exactly the same, but it was close enough for her to consider it reoccurring. The dream would always start with the sound of rain. 
which she expected came from her laptop. This would follow up with her walking into a familiar room like her bedroom, classroom, old high school, or the daycare where she worked. In the center of the room would be something for her to interact with, like a book or her games or knitting stuff. The nightmare portion started with the people in her room. Around the perimeter of her room were people that she knew, family, friends, classmates, even kids from her daycare. They were all shoulder to shoulder and they were all staring directly at her. These people wouldn't make a sound, just watch as she did whatever was set out before her. There was always at least one person though that would say something and it never changed between dreams. Don't mind us, we're only here to observe. Carry on. For this particular dream, it was her brother that said it. Whenever the narrator would turn away from her desk, those in the room would all scowl at her and then take one simultaneous step forward. They tightened the space around her by just one step each time. This would cause her to panic, of course, leading to her making mistakes or stopping to look up more often. When those surrounding her would get too close, about one foot away, a voice would be heard from behind her. A hand would reach out and touch the back of her head. Hush now, the voice would say. Turning, she would see a figure that she'd never seen before. He is distorted. His eyes are missing, just two black holes where they should be. The figure smiles and dark liquid oozes from his mouth, over his jagged, sharp teeth. He then grabs the back of her head and jerks her around to look at those surrounding her. The people that she knows, but somehow are different. They all have dark circles under their eyes and red pupils. The figure says everything is alright. This is followed by the people lunging at her, screeching. This is always when she wakes up. She can still feel the tightness around her neck and the fingers in her hair. This particular night, she decided to reach for her phone to see what time it was, but couldn't find it. She turned over to her laptop and clicked on the screen light. That's when she saw she was in a Skype call with a number of only zeros. She'd been in the call for 4 hours and 25 minutes. She'd gone to bed at 11 and it was now 3.53 a.m. On the other end of the Skype call was the man she'd seen in her dreams. He said only one thing. Don't mind me. I'm only here to observe. Carry on. Don't mind me is a story that I'd expect from the era it was written. A creepy story with some unsettling imagery and it even used a laptop. A lot of early stories incorporated computers, but most of those were used laptops. Likely because most of these stories were written by college students who just bought their first laptop. I used to listen to stories just like this one when I got my first one as well. As for the story itself, it's pretty straightforward. The dream sequence is creepy, and I love the part where the others disguised as friends and family pounce on her. It's an almost animalistic horror, one that I enjoy a lot. I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of the man is. He's just creepy, but his goals and actions are unknown. For most, that's fine. But I did want to know a little bit more about him. A fine enough story for anyone who wants a little nighttime scare. The Other Network is a creepypasta created by Stephen Shorter. It was uploaded to the Creepypasta Wiki in 2014 and is considered a classic by many that have read it. As far as internet creepypastas go, this is one that really captures the energy of the subgenre well. The story begins with the narrator making their way to a building in Northern Wales. According to an email that he received, there's a very special thing awaiting him in that building. This is access to something he calls the network. He continues by saying that he will be sharing what he found on this network, but will not be answering any further questions about it. He will also be leaving instructions for any who want to seek it out for themselves though it isn't recommended. In Northern Wales, there are mostly mountains and valleys. He was slightly familiar with the area due to a friend living nearby. He made his way up into the mountains and headed south into the foothills. He was looking for an abandoned research building. Thanks to the assistance of some hiking locals, he soon found himself at a sign that read, Gwynedd Climate Research Center. The narrator drove up the road and found that it narrowed out a bit too much to continue. His car was already being scraped by the branches along the sides. He would have to go by foot, which is fine since he'd planned for it already. Grabbing his laptop bag, he quickly made his way up the remainder of the way. Once up the hill, the narrator decides to check the perimeter of the building. Boarded windows, no visible telephone lines, and mostly covered in graffiti. The CCTV cameras all hung limply, which was a good thing in retrospect. He heads towards the building and pushes open the front door. Inside was dark, which he'd expected. He pulled out his Mac light and continued inside. The building wasn't clean by any means, but in better condition than he had expected, with light graffiti that tapered off the further in he went. The narrator found a fuse box behind the reception desk and flicked one of the switches. Nothing happened, which was to be expected. The email he'd received about the place said not to worry about the lights, but he thought he would feel more comfortable with them on if he could. 
After climbing some stairs, the narrator ended up in the room that he was looking for. It's a big office space. The room was far cleaner than the rest of the rooms he'd seen so far, and even had a little bit of sunlight streaming through the windows. Besides the thick layer of dust, you could almost call the room habitable. The room had all the office chairs and cubicles stashed into one corner, leaving most of the room pretty empty. Against the far wall was a single desk that, unlike the rest of the building, was completely free of dust. This was the spot detailed in the email. He was sure of it. Pulling out the cheap laptop he'd bought for this venture, he made a place on the desk to get to work. He didn't want to risk his own personal laptop, so this was his best investment. While booting up his laptop, the narrator fished a network cable from his bag. He reached behind the desk and found a single port. Inside the port was another network cable that had been shredded on one end. He pulled it out and plugged in the one connected to his computer. The computer didn't appear to do anything. Surprised, the narrator started looking through the laptop to see if there was any change. He thought for a moment that the power was going to be an issue, contrary to what the email had said. He opened up the CMD window to test his connection with a ping. In response, he got two or three automated responses, which meant that he had successfully gone online. The narrator opened his browser. Instead of going to the usual homepage Google, he ended up on www.patriotsearch.com. On the front page of the site was a sketch style picture of a soldier holding an American flag in one hand and a British one in the other. He left the site and tried YouTube, but got nothing in response. For going YouTube, the narrator decided to check the BBC. As it turned out, this website was available. The news headlines are where everything got interesting. Second American Civil War grows in size and intensity. U.S. troops redeployed from Afghanistan, Egypt, and Turkey to defend home soil. These were just two stories of what was available on the site's news page. With many other violent headlines and articles, it appeared to be a snapshot of another world. Somehow this one port was able to connect to a whole other reality. Was it the future or somewhere else entirely? Historical moments were similar, but different at the same time. Whole places were phased from existence. New York City was there, and then some incident happened, and it was never mentioned again. Every bad thing that could happen to our reality was happening in this one. Wars, plagues, military police states, absolute chaos. All of it was there. As he was exploring this reality, something pinged on his laptop. He looked and saw that CMD was still open. He went to check it before his screen opened a new website autonomously. The screen was white as it loaded, then started to download. A white pupilless eye was the icon of the file downloading. Fearing the worst, the narrator reached behind the desk and yanked at the cable. The download percent stopped at 75, and the computer was usable again. He took the laptop and smashed it on the ground, making sure to thoroughly destroy each individual piece with the heel of his shoe. That's his story, believe it or not. Whatever was happening on that other network in that other world, it can still be accessed from the abandoned research building. If you want to see what he saw, you simply need to make your way there. There have been talks for years to demolish that building, but to this day it still stands. Whatever it was that was downloading itself onto the narrator's laptop couldn't have been good, so fair warning to those that wish to access this place. If it starts to download again, please take the necessary precautions, because that world was full of hate, and it should never cross over into our own. The other network tells a story of an alternate universe accessible through a network port in an abandoned research facility. This topic of seeing another world's version of the internet is one that will always interest me. I just like to see what people come up with for these other realities. As far as the story goes, it's well written and really makes me want to search out the site. It presented its other world as believable as well, almost like it's a darkest timeline type scenario. It could have given us more headlines, but the ones we got were still pretty interesting. Google Maps 3D is a story that stems from a 4chan post from 2011. I'll read the article on the Creepypasta wiki first. On December 10th, 2011, an anonymous user on 4chan's X board posted a thread which told simple instructions to a location on Google Maps. The address led to a residential home in Nancy Lorraine, France. Using the 3D feature of Google Maps, the image shown to the right could be seen. Debates were made on what the being shown in the image could be. One accepted answer was that it was merely a surfboard holder. However, during the debate, Google Images censored the being, which led to the question, why would Google censor it unless it was something in which they wanted to keep hidden? Identification of the being is currently unknown. However, research and controversy remains active. So this image is one that gets shared around a lot. It is a very interesting find on Google Maps, which actually houses some very creepy stuff. Some that I'll probably have to do a video on someday. As for whatever that thing is, well, that's still up for debate. 
I've read theories that it's an expensive surfboard rack to some weird statue. Some believe it's a person in paint and others believe it's an actual alien. The reason it was blurred out was because it looked too similar to a human most likely. What's interesting now is if you go look for this image, the whole building is completely blurred out. This is probably due to people constantly going to this place to search for whatever it is. This has also led to a few conspiracy theories about it, but nothing with any concrete evidence. For now, it's just a creepy looking thing picked up on Google Maps. Pretty interesting to the internet collective overall. My dead girlfriend keeps messaging me on Facebook is a no sleep story that was posted in 2014. The story has 21k upvotes and is one of the more memorable stories I've read recently. The story was created by Nate SW and follows a man dealing with the loss of his girlfriend. The story starts by telling you that Emily died on August 7th of 2012. She had been in a three car crash while on her way home. She had passed in minutes of the collision taking place. Even so, she was somehow sending the narrator messages over Facebook Messenger. 13 months after Emily had passed, he received his first message. It said hello, and when the narrator named Nathan tried to answer back, it just repeated hello. His first thought was Susan, Emily's mom, accidentally sending him a message. She was the only other person with access to the Facebook account. The Facebook page was left active so that Nate could go through it and look through old pictures. It was done to memorialize his girlfriend, who he had been with for five years before her passing. Emily's mother was hardly on the page as she didn't really even know how to use a computer. Around February, Nathan started to receive notifications on Facebook that Emily was tagging herself in his photos. All of the photos that were tagged were places that Emily had been when she was still alive. The unsettling nature of these two screenshots he'd grabbed really started to weigh on him. Soon the Facebook page would start to recycle the things that Nathan had sent to her. It would bring up places they'd been and repeat messages he'd sent her directly. It felt almost like a glitch or bot was messaging him. All the leads from Facebook just pointed to the locations the messages were being sent from, which were all locations she had been to before, their apartment, her mom's house, her workplace. Eventually the messages started talking about being cold. They were still recycled until something changed. Freezing was sent at the end of a string of messages about being cold. Neither of them had ever used that word in their messages. It was a unique word and it was typed differently. This message is what led to Nathan deciding to finally memorialize her page. Well, the real reason was the messages that came right after this exchange. She sent him the entire message thread from when he was trying to contact her before he found out that she'd passed. He was so worried and trying to reach her, but of course, he would never talk to her again. After memorializing her page, the messages stopped. This is what the final message of the story says. I just got a notification. I heard the alert sound. I'm just too afraid to swap windows and check it. I checked the alert. I heard it as I was compiling all this together. This was the message. An image was attached to the message. That's my door. That's my computer. I got the messages three hours ago, but I didn't want to check them until now. Now I'm legitimately scared. I have no idea who took this photo. I'm on my tablet in my garage. Zen for now, going to drive to friends. Forgot to open the garage door in my panic, so building up the nerve to get out to do that now. This story was originally posted on No Sleep, and the rule of No Sleep is that the story can continue in the comments. This is because No Sleep is a place where everyone who reads the story becomes part of the story. Every story is real in the sub, which makes for some interesting storytelling opportunities. That ending that I just read was found in the comments. It wasn't part of the original story above. It also has another section attached to it that reads, I should be scared. I've occasionally opened a heart. Just up, it's very not me. She's more real to me in that state. This section sounds so out of place, and that's because every piece of this section was taken from either the original post or things he was saying in replies to others on the post. I should be scared. I saw her after the accident. I keep getting mental pictures of her in that state, trying desperately to contact me. I don't know if I'm scared because I'm weak or scared because I should be scared. Thank you. I've occasionally opened. There are a few things that got to me though. No one really knows that her legs were shorn off in the accident but it's possible whoever just got lucky with that comment about walking. I've occasionally opened her chat window and have seen the Emily is typing message. The message usually never comes through. Whoever it is, is really dedicated to the joke. A heart. I don't own anything with a heart on it and no one was over that night. That's definitely heart-like though. Really weird. This continues for the entire message. This is telling us what happened. 
Emily, or the entity pretending to be here, has got Nathan. The account that he was on has gone silent, save for those last few messages. The story ends here, but with a lot of speculation. For starters, there's a theory that Emily actually wasn't the one in the accident, and that it was reversed. This comes from a post about an accident that took place where one of the deceased was a man named Nathan. It took place in the same area where the story supposedly does. There's also a theory that Emily is actually the one who's writing this entire message, and that Nathan has nothing to do with it. All of this was found in the comment section of the No Sleep thread. It was a very fun read, honestly. It added so much to a story that I feel I've heard before. It really allows you to explore the themes and ideas presented in the story. Though, we'll never really know the answer. It's best that way, as people can speculate and keep the story alive. Definitely one of the better no-sleep stories that I've come across. My Dark Web Experience, The Visiting, is a creepypasta written by Tales from the Abyss and uploaded to the wiki in 2015. The story focuses on an aspect of the internet that many people are interested in, that being the dark web. The story opens with our narrator explaining that he and his girlfriend just turned 18, and thus were trusted enough by their parents to stay home alone. Now, the narrator's girlfriend was a huge horror fan. She read every creepypasta and watched every horror movie. This meant that she was into some pretty gory stuff. One night after a few drinks, the two sat down to watch a movie. The horror movie sites that his girlfriend liked to frequent were down, so she had other thoughts in mind. She asked if he'd ever heard of the dark web. The narrator answers yes, while leaving the room to get some water. He came back to see his girlfriend searching some shady looking movie site. There were tons of movies with titles and covers that he had never seen before. He guessed they were foreign movies. And he was right. The movie that his girlfriend was currently hovering over was a movie called The Visiting which only had a white background with black aerial font text on it. The movie seemed interesting to them both. The narrator pulled out his phone and started searching for any reviews or a plot synopsis online, but came up empty-handed. When he put his phone down, he noticed that his girlfriend was putting order details in. He quickly tried to stop her, but she had already submitted it. He started to explain to her the danger that comes with giving out your address to some shady site, but she was too drunk to even know what he was saying. With a bit of frustration, he went to bed deciding that he would confront her in the morning. Three days later, while the narrator was over at her house again, they were home alone and watching The Exorcist. During a lull in the movie, the narrator's girlfriend was teasing him about how scared he'd looked when she'd ordered that movie off the dark web. Just as a bit of silence surrounds them, there's a loud knock on the door. It sounds almost like it echoed across the house. The narrator gets up to check it and sees a tall man in a ski mask holding a hammer. He steps away, hopefully unseen, and hears a loud scream from the living room. His girlfriend points to a window where another man is standing in her backyard. The narrator grabs his girlfriend's hand and they run upstairs to hide in the master bedroom and called the police. The sound of the door slamming open can be heard, followed by a language he doesn't recognize. The sounds of footsteps around the house causes him to go fully into fight or flight mode. He pushes his girlfriend toward the window and tells her to jump. She does so and he stands around for a second thinking about fighting them to give her enough time to escape. When he hears the men closing in on the room, his flight response takes over, and he jumps out the window as well. The two make it to a nearby park. They're completely out of breath and having a hard time calming down. The police call the narrator and tell him that the men are gone and they are safe to come back now. After getting his girlfriend to stop crying, they head back towards her home. A few days later, the narrator finally hears back on the investigation. The visiting was a nickname locals in a small Polish town gave to a number of brutal murders that occurred in the late 90s. They might be related to a few attacks that had happened recently. It was thought to be a local gang that was committing home invasions and bludgeoning their victims to death. At the narrator's girlfriend's house, they also found a bag that they left behind. In the bag was one blank VHS tape and three that had recordings on them. They were creating snuff films to sell on the dark web, meaning that could have been the fate that they may have come to that night. A short while after that, the narrator and his girlfriend broke up at the behest of her parents. They blamed him for ordering the VHS online, and she was now seeking mental health services. Her mental state had taken a toll since that night, and her parents were doing everything they could to help her. The police still haven't found the men responsible, and it's likely that they never will. My Dark Web Experience, The Visiting, is an interesting read that I didn't really expect to feel as grounded as it did. Not that every story needs a grounding in reality, but some stories feel better for it. I don't really have much to say about this one. The dark web is oftentimes considered a cliche for these types of stories, but I don't think so. 
you can still tell a pretty good story using the dark or deep web. Support call ID 100156-03 is a creepypasta that was uploaded to the creepypasta wiki in 2015. The story was written by Charmingly Shallow. The story is told through a support call between an unnamed man and the support operator named Sam. The man was calling because he was having issues with his phone recently. He had recently got a new update for his phone and found that he was having issues with the speech recognition. The phone when asked to look for nearby restaurants instead brought up local graveyards. When he asked for images for his new background, he instead got gore and disturbing imagery. Sam keeps asking him for the different issues he's having with his phone until she asks what version he is using. The version name, he says, is called Android 2.2.3 Flesh. This apparently is the wrong version, as it should be 2.2.3 Froyo. After talking with her manager, she comes back to the phone and says they need to change the phone version. She asks for the phone, which he says his daughter is using currently. Sam urges him to get his phone back from his daughter, as the update has known issues when using the voice chat feature. The man thinks she's kidding until he walks into the room and sees his daughter acting strange. There's something red in her eye. Blood. She is bleeding from her eyes and ears. Freaked out, he grabs the phone away. Then he complains of being bitten by his daughter. Sam tells him to leave the house and close and lock the doors behind him, but it appears to be too late. There's a scream and then the sound of something eating on the other line. She leaves the call with the final message. If you can still hear me, sir, thank you for calling your mobile phone help support. A specialist, contractor, and cleanup crew have been dispatched to your address to deal with your ongoing issue. We are sorry for any inconveniences caused. The phone call then ends. Another story where I think it's pretty self-explanatory and I don't have much to say. I do find it more funny than scary, but it's definitely a little in between. Somehow the software update turned his daughter into a zombie, an occurrence that's happened enough that they have a whole cleanup crew for it. The Cuckoo Conundrum is a creepypasta that was uploaded to the wiki in 2014. The story was written by MP Real Invective. It follows the story of a man who decided to move away from home. The story starts with the narrator telling us that they are going to ask a question at the end of their story, one that he needs our help in answering. The question is something they aren't able to answer clearly themselves, so they hope that we can help in their moment of need. After college, the narrator moved away from home. It was 20 hours from his family, friends, and the life that he once knew. His reason was simple. He wanted to forge ahead on his own and see what the world had in store for him. He always felt coddled at home, so this was a chance for him to become a bit more independent. It was easy enough at first. He got a good job, was able to get an apartment, and was slowly starting to make a good life for himself. Soon though, he started to feel homesick. It wasn't just that, but that he was also missing out on all the important moments in his family's lives. First he missed his brother graduating from college. It was a big moment for him, but the narrator, of course, was working and couldn't go. Next was the celebratory dinner of their parents, who had been together for 40 years. The final straw, though, was when his sister had her child. He got a single text message, not even a call. All of this was starting to compound together, making him feel like he made the wrong call moving away. There's a little bit of hope, though. The family had gotten together and got the sister baby monitor system, with a webcam built in. It was able to be monitored online, as long as you had the password. This meant that every member of the family could look in on the baby whenever they wanted. At first, the narrator wasn't too comfortable doing that. He just didn't feel like it was right to just stare at the screen and see his nephew, not to mention all the security risks. Besides, his sister was sending plenty of photos and videos of his nephew to the group chat already. It wasn't until the narrator was going through a rough patch that he decided to finally check the camera feed. There was something about seeing his nephew sleeping so soundly in his crib that eased his tensions. Lately, he'd developed insomnia, and watching the baby monitor was slowly helping him to actually get some sleep at night. Everything seemed to be going better. Until one night, while watching the baby monitor, the narrator swore that he saw something. It looked like a person's face, but it happened so fast and he was dozing off. He chalked it up to being tired, but still watched the feed for a while, where nothing happened. A week later, he saw something again. This night was a bit different. As the narrator had gone out drinking with some friends, when he came home, the world was still spinning, so he decided that laying down would be the last thing he'd want to do. This led to him turning on the monitor, and there it was. Something was crawling across the wall opposite the baby's crib. It looked like something you'd find in an alien film. 
It had spindly limbs and a grayish skin tone. It was three feet in length and it moved slowly. The narrator panicked and dialed his sister. She answered groggily but woke up after he'd mentioned seeing something in her son's room. She woke up her husband and had him check, but couldn't find anything in the room. The narrator asked him to look under the crib and if there was anything down there. He said there was a vent but was hesitant to believe that anything could fit in there. The sister was aggravated about being woken up but thanked him for watching her son. He lied and told her that he saw a rat in the room. That it somehow got near the crib. He had to lie. There was no way that she would believe what he actually saw. The narrator then decided that he would need to catch the thing in the act and record it for proof, which led to him skipping work for a few days to watch the camera at night. His boss wasn't happy, and when he missed the second day, he was promptly fired. It didn't matter though. He needed to keep his nephew safe. A few more nights passed and the narrator was starting to doubt his sanity. There was nothing. The camera feed was just his nephew sleeping. That is until around 4 a.m. one morning. It returned. The thing was back on the wall, and this time the narrator got a better look at it. The thing had a face like a human's, without a nose. It had spider-like limbs and was moving slowly over the crib. It took a second before it started to descend towards the baby. The narrator grabbed his phone and started to call his sister, but it went to voicemail. She had silenced her phone. The chest cavity of the creature opened up and a worm appeared to slither out. The baby woke up and started to scream. Just as he did, the worm was placed in his mouth and he was forced to swallow it. The cries brought the sister into the room who didn't see the creature as it had already slithered away, its job apparently done. The narrator, having lost his job, decided to just move back home. He got a new job with some pull from his dad and settled back into life there. He did everything to push that night out of his mind, like it never happened. After all, his nephew appeared to be growing up healthy and normal. It was fine, until the day that he had to babysit his nephew. The narrator was bouncing the baby on his knee and watching him laugh. This is when he saw something look as if it was slithering under his skin. It looked almost like the worm the creature had forced down his throat that night. This is where he asks us his question. This thing is probably not his sister's child anymore. It is an imposter. So should he take care of the problem now? Or is he actually just insane? Had the stress from his previous job driven him insane? Or was he the only sane one here? There's a pillow next to him. He could so easily solve this problem. But should he? The Cuckoo Conundrum is a story that's ending makes you question the validity of the narrator. Fully I expected there to be something wrong, like the baby attacking him after transforming into that thing. What I got instead was a man who believes he saw something turn his nephew into a monster, but did it actually happen? Based on everything from the story, it sounds more like he's having some kind of stress breakdown. The time between when he saw it happen that night and when the ending takes place is only a few months. He could still be troubled from his stressful environment, or it could be real. It's hard to tell because most of the evidence could be pointed either way. Every time he saw the creature, it was during the night when he was either extremely tired or drunk. Both of these situations make for an unreliable narrator. But what do you think? Is this man losing it, or did he just see something that could be a problem later? Perfection is a no-sleep story posted on the subreddit in 2016 by Abel Doctor. The story focuses on a teen who became a bit of a shut-in after his friends all graduated high school before him. This was because he was held back a year due to an illness. The narrator and his friends were obsessed with 4chan. They were always on the site and browsing the tabs. It wasn't until they found out about the deep web that they found a new obsession. It started with one friend and then quickly became all of them. While searching the deep web, the narrator was already getting accustomed to how the exploration worked. He would see all sorts of things, some that he wanted to see, and many that he didn't want to. When he would find something illegal, he would report it and keep moving. Eventually, one of the narrator's friends was told the way to search for a site based on its location. He wasn't sure how it worked, but he was intrigued. This led to him finding a site that was registered to someone only two hours from his house. This interested him, and he found that the site was a bit weird. The web design was abhorrent, the layout was wonky and incredibly ugly. The only words on the page were number one devotee, repeating over and over again. The narrator, finally figuring out how to navigate the site, found himself in a chat room. The chat was very active, but every member had a generic male name, like Brad or Tim. They were all repeating phrases related to someone they called perfection. Further digging through the site, the narrator found some clips, documents, and even some images. The sound clips were of perfection, doing random things. 
laundry, moving things around the house, and other mundane tasks. Just the image of these people going to their obsession's house and recording their daily lives to share online was very strange and creepy. He hit up the image section next. Images of a baby and its mother were plastered all over the place. There was something oddly familiar about the woman, but the images were old and blurry. There was no way he'd be able to figure out anything from them alone. As for the documents, they all read like poorly written fan fiction. They all mentioned their relationship with perfection, how they loved each other, and that this world was too impure for them. It was all starting to get under his skin. This is when the narrator noticed that the very active chat room had ceased its activity. He pulled up the tab and wrote that he was just passing by, so don't mind him. The responses came quickly. Are you proud of this world? A member asked. It was an odd question, and one he didn't know how to answer. What? He said. Another response. You must be proud. What do you think? These questions weren't making any sense. It's okay, don't be shy. My house is your house. Look around. Eventually the narrator wrote in chat, It's something. You guys are really obsessed with this guy. Who is he anyway? There's a pause in chat before this message was typed. He is perfection. He is God. I live my life to serve him so that one day he may grace me with his approval. This world is far too filthy for him. I must continue to create our utopia. The narrator started to type that it was a crazy invasion of privacy before something dawned on him. The images of the house, the woman in the photos, the baby. It was him. He was this perfection. They asked him if this world was to his liking. Then a flood of messages from multiple members filled the page. I love you. They all wrote the same message over and over again. The narrator yanked the cord from his computer. He smashed his PC and buried it in the woods near his house. He couldn't take this anymore. If he was a shut-in before, he's now a full-on hermit. He never found out who this person was, the one that made the site. He doesn't think he ever will either. Someone has dug up his PC. He already knows who, but he doesn't want to think about it. He still panics if anything in his house just happens to go missing. This story is an interesting read for multiple reasons. One, the story kind of alludes to the ending pretty early on, but that didn't detract from the weird finding. Online stalker stories are popular on Reddit, but this one reads more like finding out you accidentally became the leader of a cult. The most interesting part of the story to me, though, isn't the story itself. It's in the comment section. Everyone is typing that they finally found perfection. They knew he couldn't hide from them forever. And I just like that a lot. Hello again, friends. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. This has been a long time coming, as it took me far longer to research and write than any of the other icebergs previously. Probably because there are so many stories that could fit into this category. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters, Blow Nose, Nora Kingsley, Icy Dice, Ryoma, Bazingle, and Hamter. Without your help, this channel and its content wouldn't be possible. Thank you to everyone that watches my videos, sends me encouraging messages on Discord, or leaves me comments on these videos. I wouldn't be able to do what I love without all of you. As always, thanks for everything. I hope you all have a good night.